Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. A little late, 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 late show. I'm your host, Jesse Melman. And we have a series of great guests tonight. We're going to be talking about dreams, about sleep, about the oneric state, maybe even some conversation about somnambulism that comes up. I'm not sure what they call the other one, sleep talking. But that one is probably a word for it. Somnambulism. but it's the Asian is from conversation you, know, you can choose with your portmanteaus where things are coming from we have a musical guest um, they'll do some some lullabies for us it's even some interviews with uh, some man on the street stuff because I know that you guys like that And I hope it's, you know, interesting, but not too interesting. I don't want to get in the way of your sleep. I don't mind the idea of feeding your dreams a little bit. I'm going to try to do some of that, but it shouldn't be too disruptive. It's been a long, long year. It's only January. The nights are really long. They're getting shorter. So those are just some kind of facts that um, are worth mentioning. I think the monologue's going pretty well. I mean, We didn't think about having any jokes. Every dream I had a couple nights ago, I was in California in some combination of Bolinas and Salinas. And I went to this little shoppy, this kind of um, <clears throat> seaside gallery place that would maybe normally have oil paintings of the water. And they were doing a show of um, John Baldessari's work and um, so I went there and that was really nice, um, you know, because I love his work and it was great to see it paired next to, um, you know, oil paintings of the sea, some seascapes. It was quite sublime. There was some conversation about where I was from and that, you know, comes up sometimes during these conversations. In this case, it had to do partially with that my car had the license plate that it does now. So it was certainly set in this very moment and um, my job was a, a traffic conductor, but in a much more kind of um, semiotic way. I was doing semaphores and trying to spell things out. And I guess maybe part of the concern about where I was coming from had to do with why I was doing that in their town, Salinas Bolinas. Um, I don't write down my dreams that often. I mean, I'm writing down raps a lot, and um, I guess those are related insofar as that they somehow come out of your mind and then into the world. But I can't claim that I invented dream rap. We have this song coming up that's... Um, by Z, 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 Top. And I hope that that is interesting to you. I don't know. I don't know about that band. They have, I guess some early records are pretty good. I think it's funny that they have beards, I guess. I think that's part of what's going on with that band. They have these really long beards. I don't know that band very well, if I'm being honest. I know they have really long beards and there was one extra Z 
then maybe they would be the band sleep. Thinking about ZZZ tops and I wasn't able to get the proper nightcap for this, but I feel like this works okay. I wanted to get a whole pajama set for the show, but our budget is really low. And, um, and this is what I sleep in anyway. This is a camel hair coat that, um, it's a women's coat, not that that matters, but that I got at a thrift store here in New Mexico, probably, God, decades ago. I mean, even if it was a decade and a fraction of a decade. I mean, a lot of years are just fractions of decades if you don't think about it. This one also has a kind of nice feature, which is that there's a little green fuzz ball in this pocket. And then if you do this whole elaborate, I guess I'll do it for you guys. Mmm, cadabrin, cadabrin, pocket magic, pocket magic. Let's see if it worked. It did. So there'll be a little bit of magic, some comedy, some songs, you know, late night stuff. Stick around. this weird one recently I was <laughs> I was uh I was just dreaming about being on the beach right but it wasn't a normal beach it was like a hot tub like it, there was a spiral but uh all these people were skateboarding surfing like it was there were skateboard there were skateboards on the the waves and um yeah it was pretty interesting I mean because I also like <laughs> I had this song stuck in my head and I woke up and I couldn't figure out what it was I couldn't figure out what it was I couldn't figure out what it was but um it was a theme song to uh to democracy now so yeah it was like like she was like i don't know it was it was, really, it was weird but like um you know the way that sometimes it is like it's the beach but it's not the beach it's like a sand but it's actually just like a pool table so it's like a pool that was a beach that was also a hot tub you know like i don't know does that make any sense Welcome back to the late, 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 late show. I'm your host, Jesse Mahmoud. And tonight we're going to be talking to Alison Sakala. She's an artist whose work spans photography, filmmaking, painting, music. She's also a, a yogi and a uh, great chef and a connector of people, delightful person. I've known her now for more than half my life. We were um, both assigned to live on the same floor, both not assigned, um, given the good grace of living on the same floor our freshman year of college. She's a great friend, great friend of the show. It's hard to imagine what the late, 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 late show would be like without her. So 
If you'll please put your hands together for Alison Sakala. Hello, Allison. Hi. <laughs> I actually just woke up. That's good. What were you dreaming about? I, I, um, so at first I woke up and I couldn't, I was like, oh, I didn't, I can't remember, but then, um, I realized that I was, I had this, I was dreaming of this, I was in Maine and where I am now. And um, I was like playing with my, or my cousin was visiting, which she actually just was. And her kid was outside playing with this girl who was maybe like a teenager and was like babysitting her. And I don't know if it's like from the babysitting, but she came inside the, the girl that was babysitting and she was like upset kind of complaining that I guess at her at her job someone had said that she was racist mm -hmm. and then and she was like complaining that that they had called her out somehow and I was like so did you learn your lesson and then she didn't but she didn't and she like kept complaining and I was like frustrated and then I woke up so you do you, was was the incident um, in question described during the dream, or you could just feel it? Uh, it was. I could just tell. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened. Yeah. But you, but you knew that there was like some level of culpability on her part. You like, did you learn your lesson? Like both, you're not terrible, but also maybe something happened. Yeah, something definitely happened. Like she definitely did something bad that was racist or said something that was racist. And she was kind of like rough and tough, this girl and like like a rebellious teenager. And she had like a really tight ponytail and she was just kind of like, yeah, complaining about the situation that, and I felt like whoever said that she was racist was was right, but I don't know what exactly happened. So I don't know. Was there some incident when she was visiting you that uh, you think like birthed this dream? No, I have no idea. I mean, we did talk about, I've talked, I did talk to her about like how white it is in Maine and how weird that is. And, but we didn't experience anything firsthand aside from, oh, my pillow. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't know. How do you uh, how do you normally deal with your dreams? Do you spend like is that part of your waking life of, of just upon waking up is thinking about processing your dreams or? Um. So normally no. Um. Or or like historically, actually sporad. I would say sporadically, and I'm in a mode right now where I am trying to remember them. And I have to actually try to remember because if I just wake up, I'll, it'll kind of come to me. Um, it'll kind of come to me, but then uh, I have to actually like write it down. I have a, so I have like a notebook next to my bed these days. And um, so if I wake up, I'll try to remember. Otherwise it's like, there's no hope it just like flies out of my mind and maybe some point in the day I might like think of it, but yeah. So are you, you're now instead of, I don't know what your previous routine was like, but instead of looking at your phone or getting up to pee or something like that, you're like trying to intentionally have your first act be to write it down? Yeah. 
Are there any so it's cool that you asked me to do this because I am in like a dream remembering mode. I'm in a very introspective mode right now. And that's why. Um, so I'm trying to see what's going on in my subconscious and I'm not always interested in it, but I am right now. So, so what, are, what are some things you've experienced recently that have been like in, in an anarch dream state that have been exciting for you? Um, By the way, your clock ticking is like the perfect uh, comedic foil for silence. <laughs> It's so loud. It was really cheap. And I think that's probably why <laughs> it's like one, one battery and it's like plastic. Um, well, I'm trying not to look at my phone. It's like, so, cause it ruins my experience. Like if I go to sleep looking at my phone or wake up looking at it. Um, I'm trying to think of like exciting moments. Are your, are your dreams right now, do they take place in, in the COVID times? Yeah, generally, yeah. I mean, it's like usually in the recent past, um, but a lot of times like historic events in my life will come up, but they will take place in like the, the now time. Like now your grandmother has a mask on? Or maybe not something like that I mean a lot of times my dreams are about loss like they're about like things that I that yeah that I've lost that I'm maybe not finished on that or that I don't really understand or that I still have some like emotional connection to like like the debt like death will come up or like old partners will come up um or I don't know just like weird unresolved like experiences or like if I'm not having sex I'll have sex more in my dreams <laughs> like things that are like lacking or something that like I may not actually acknowledge in my waking life will come up um so yeah interesting but How sometimes they're fun I mean that sounds like they're all bummers though they're not I mean some of them are just like weird little anecdotes like the one that I was just having when I woke up um yesterday oh yeah yesterday I had one that was kind of funny um I had some roommates once that are not roommates they lived in the same apartment building and they had a bunch of pets and I just I remember thinking like because I try to remember like the seed of the thought that kind of like tri like triggered it and these people so they had like um they had a rat they had a dog they had like I don't know, some other road. And, and they lived in this really tiny apartment already for two people. And I just remember thinking like, oh, that's like a lot of things in one apartment. And is that okay? And I don't know. And so in this dream, they had actually, they were actually living in my apartment and I was living with someone else too. And like they went away for vacation. And I remember like we kept hearing like, oh, they had a bird in the dream. We kept hearing like the tweeting bird. And like, remember thinking like, where's the bird? And like, did they leave enough food? And I don't know. And, and, and so eventually like I opened the door to this room and like there was a bird there and they hadn't fed it. And I was just like, oh my God, what do we do? And the same thing happened with a pig. They had this like big pig and it was like, it ran, and I opened the door and it like ran out and then uh and it was like dirty like it was like a farm pig it wasn't like a cute pet that you would have as a, like I don't know and then like I went to the bathroom and there was another door that opened to this guy's bedroom um for some reason and I knocked on the door and he was like he had been there the whole time and I was just like what the fuck like you need to take care of your pets and he like came out and he had like dyed his hair and he was he was like one of my students kind of <laughs> neglecting um neglecting this little thing and yeah and then I woke up but so I don't know like sometimes they're fun and like weird like that too and they're like very close to reality like that they could potentially happen like I don't dream in like crazy colors or like I don't know they're not that fantastical but they sort of are in when I actually write them down yeah. yeah 
That's great. I also love, I mean, I feel like a, a common trope is a sort of like finding a new, like a door in your apartment and being like, oh my God, there's a whole other room. Like, why have I not been using this? But that in, in your situation, it was like then entering into somebody else's space. It's very funny. Like, oh, the other room was this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how does, do you, uh, how do, do you, how in parentheses do you incorporate your, your dreams into your creative practice, into your other parts of your life that maybe, um, yeah, I mean, specifically creative practice, but also if it's maybe your cooking practice or yoga practice. Or yeah, no, I mean, so it doesn't, no, like my subconscious and I don't know, sort of feels kind of deeply personal and surreal and I think that as of right now it doesn't really have anything to do with like the outward facing creative practice that I have but I'm interested in having it be more related and so I think that that's part of why I'm trying to like remember things and see what's going on under the surface because I think a lot of times I sort of get in the way of like the weird experience that I have of being a human and being able to express that and so like right now I have like the opportunity the luxury to like be writing things down and especially right now I'm on break from teaching so like I can sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't want to, cause I have, cause I'll wake up a lot and I have this, like this light that I'm holding is actually not very bright. I'm, I'm it's one of those salt lamp things. <laughs> um, but it doesn't totally fuck up my, like, I don't know, my wiring so that I can't go back to sleep. But, um, yeah, so I want, yes, yeah, so I want it to be more part of it. it there was one time I did a residency where I was doing this too and I ended up writing a lot um because I was writing the dreams down and I ended up like turning them into some short stories um and I'm really I love like surreal writing um that doesn't maybe quite there's a there's a book called um Babysitter at Rest by Jen George. And it's very, it was, it ended up, I realized it was really similar to the writing that I was doing with the dreams. And um, so I started writing, but then I stopped. So I don't know, maybe that'll happen again. I don't know. I didn't have any anything to do with it because normally I don't write. So it just like, I shared it with, with uh, Polly and Maggie and, and that was it. And they liked it. <laughs> so yeah. Do you think that in terms of that, that sort of thing of like um, taking your dream and then trying to like translate it into another space, writing is uh, a great way of doing that. But also, I mean, between, you have multiple different ways of making things, but let's say just between like painting and photography or not photography, like lens-based works so of photography and filmmaking, is there a way that one of those you feel more comfortable with sort of like constructing a new, like to make? No, I mean, I feel like the 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 observed world, has its own strangeness that I that I think um, that that isn't kind of in its um, appearance isn't mediated through necessarily you know the thing that I'm actually seeing I guess it is in a way because I'm 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 framing but you know what I mean like I'm not creating like a set where like my dreams play out um, so I think that it's like a different way of of working. I mean, painting potentially could, but even with painting, like I'm, I'm really interested in observation. And I think that there can be some imaginative interpretation happening with painting because I'm creating forms with color and gesture and, but it's less like about kind of invented narrative. Um, Yes, I don't know. Maybe like music though is a way for sure. Like I like when I've when I think about writing song lyrics, which I don't do very often, I think that a lot of times I'm drawn to songs that's that have like a that sort of surreal dreamlike quality to them. Like um I was just listening to like this old Scout Niblet album, and there's a song called Dinosaur Egg. 
I so and I've also been listening to Dinosaur Act and like it's funny that I'm like drawn to this dinosaur thing I mean they're totally different songs but like the lyrics are like dinosaur egg do you know the song no but I know dinosaur act and I always think that it's dinosaur egg and then only oh, in the no. movie was I like well maybe she was confused too because they came out actually maybe like a year apart scout and a little later um <laughs> like uh, i think in like 2000 the things we lost in the fire was like 2006 and then this was 2007 but the lyrics are like dinosaur egg dinosaur egg um when will you hatch because I've got a million people coming on Friday and they expect to see a dinosaur, not an egg. And I just like, I just think it's so funny. And like, where did she come up with that? And I don't know. So who knows, maybe a dream, I don't know. But I think of it as a dream like thing. Um, yeah, that makes sense. It feels also very much like a good thing where it's like you, I don't know, think or say or sing just like a word into being. And then you try to like, work out the logic of it and so it's like once you've said dinosaur egg, then you're like okay so now what do we do with this dinosaur egg? like it, it's large uh are people coming over am i making dinosaur egg salad sandwiches or am i excited that the dinosaur is being born do i am i a dinosaur am i the parent like yeah 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 even just like just that word is just so and it's just not a word that i would encounter normally and to kind of you and it comes that, that like she that's sort of like the chorus there's not it's a kind of weird or free form song and there's not really a chorus but that is the chorus if there is one um so yeah anyway it's uh i don't know do you feel like the um <clears throat> the song falls instead of like a more chorus first chorus whatever sort of structure like the dreamy logic of like everything makes sense until you look back and then it doesn't make any sense but like on the way along it did well, I think that in the song, I mean, music can make sense of a lot of things that that don't typically make sense. So, so it follows. Yeah, it it ends up following its own logic. And then when I look back at like, and I can sing along with it and like get into it and kind of stand behind, like whatever's being said because of maybe the emotion that it's conveying. And then when I look back at the actual words, I'm just like, wait, that that's what I'm I'm experiencing here. Like I don't experience the word. The, it's almost like they the words trend. Yeah, they're they're transcendent. Um, they're they're transcending their wordness um, when they're in the song. So I don't know if that answers the question, but no, that's great um yeah I can't believe I'm actually able to talk I was sort of worried because sometimes I wake up and I'm totally out of it and I can't think very well but it's going okay <laughs> well, you're so articulate it makes me wonder if you actually just have like been awake all day been ready no. for coffee no. okay. I'm like I mean I can't I'm I have not been awake so it's one I am. I haven't gone to bed this late in, I don't remember when, like I never ever stay up this late. So I really did go to bed at like 1030. <laughs> so. Um, well, thank you so much for being a guest on the late, 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 late show. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It felt serendipitous. So. Thank you. That's how dreams feel. That's how talk shows feel, I heard. Oh, yeah. Well, good ones. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay, audience, we'll be right back. Allison, thank you so much. One more big hand for Allison Sakala, please. <laughs> this, is, this is the big hand for Allison Sakala right now. Bye, Allison. That was great. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Uh, I mean, kind of, I mean, well, we, we have a lot of, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess I would say that we have a lot of dread, well, about, <clears throat> about death. What about you? Yeah, I mean, yeah, death. Yeah. We hear it the late, 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 late show are a late, 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 late. Late, late, late to have our next guest with us. Please welcome 
to the show. Polly got Polly math. Polly performer, writer, sculptor, drawer, filmmaker, animator, former barista. Wonderful, interesting, fascinating person and actor. Someone who actually might have some projects that they could uh, promote on the show. Please welcome Michael Paul Lopez. Hi, Mike. Hey, what's up? Can you hear me? Yeah. Where are we finding you? Are you at work right now? Um, it's not work I get paid for, but I think it's work in a way, you know? Sleep is work. Yeah. Good. <laughs> what, uh, so tell us uh, what kind of things have you been have you been dreaming about recently? Um, I had a dream that I, I married my mom the other night. I'm not kidding. It's like the most uh, stereotypically Freudian thing, and I wasn't into it at all. Um, were you were you both? Um, was it like your ages had shifted, and you were both in your twenties at some point, or was it like right now? Did you know it was your mom? Like, okay, I was like, right now. Was. It was right now. It was a reveal. Like, it, it, it dawned on me that I married my mom. <laughs> and I was in a tent at one point. And uh, it was raining. Um, that's about it. That's, that's all I remember. But I always look forward to going to sleep. And I... Before I go to sleep, I usually um, want hope for really cool dreams because I feel like they're, I feel, I do actually feel like it's getting some work, uh, some emotional work done. So I guess, well, a couple of questions that stem directly from that for me are, could you tell us a little bit about, I mean, do you have tricks for how to produce a sort of more interesting dream? Are there things you think about? Are there ways you think about it? Breathing exercises, things you watch or something? Or how do you, what have you found as ways of doing it? Um, well, I used, like everyone with too much time on their hands, I wanted to do um, lucid dreaming at some point. Yeah. And to do that, they say, you, according to the internet, you have to um, record your dreams every night and it's cool. Uh, yeah, this is something I did like in college. And um, it just, it takes too much time. Because <laughs> once you start remembering your dreams, you remember more and more that it becomes like a 45 minute long process. I'm really liking the way I look on this right now. It looks really cool. Yeah, it looks like you have a mohawk. Oh, that's so cool. Um, yeah, so I don't do it. For having good dreams, I just try to relax and I don't know, I, you know, it kills me. I used to write them down. I could, I have like several notebooks that I've had. Let me see if I wrote any dreams down that aren't too um, insane. Well, so also, like you, you were mentioning that you think of it, I mean, half jokingly, I believe we can check the tape, but about it as a kind of work and thinking about it as doing this sort of this emotional work and this emotional processing. But I'm wondering, does it also serve for you uh, as an artist, as a writer whose work often kind of moves into spaces that maybe could be described as dreamlike? Um, are there ideas that come from that? Is it more about the approach of having a kind of flexibility and mental flexibility? Does that, does that side of work also figure into it? Um, I don't have anything. I, this is mostly just notes and other stuff I write. Um, the work, 
Um, I think um, the, work, uh, the work, uh, you know, a lot of people think that dreams are um, your brain creating like its own uh, story and language to process what's going on. And I think that's true. But I don't know how that affects us. What's fun, which, which is really crazy, is um, waking up and uh, uh, the other night I was falling asleep. I, I can't answer your question. <laughs> the other night I was falling asleep and I was uh, having a dream where I was like kind of on a conveyor belt and this is a, and, um, and there's a little slot. And in that slot, I saw like a deranged character. Um, what I really saw was just like an old grizzled man's face. But, you know, in the dream, there's, um, in dreams, you kind of have, uh, uh, you kind of know like the story instant instantaneously know the story of certain characters and stuff like that mm -hmm. as if you were watching a movie and this old man in the in my dream I'm not trying to sound crazy but I think it makes sense in the dream I knew was like a bad person and I was about to be sucked into um, this conveyor belt and this person would have control over me and I literally woke up and screamed no <laughs> No! No! Uh, and then Amelia started laughing and Aaron's like, <laughs> and um, which I think is cool because I don't know, this just doesn't normally happen. Um, but I always think that's interesting in dreams is um, I remember having a dream early on in high school when I was watching a lot of movies and maybe watching so many movies that the rhythms of certain movies were becoming more apparent and I can get like the timing down of movies. I can still, I still have a sense that I can tell the exact middle of a movie. Mm. Um, act, when act 2.1 becomes 2.2, I usually have a good, I can, I can stop a movie and be like, this is the exact middle, it's usually pretty good. And spotting when the third act is happening, which I think isn't a special power, but I guess it's I guess I'm, it's something I'm proud of. Um, but anyways, you can, I think I remember having a dream in high school and having feelings in this story and the dream having the structure of a movie. Um, and I thought that was I haven't really sorted out why that's why I still think about it what what sort of movies are you talking about at that moment in terms of like it uh internalizing the rhythms but in into your sleeping life this is probably um high school let's see is 2000 graduated 2001 so early 2000 late 90s i don't know i wouldn't watch anything i had a pretty was it, it wasn't about sort of like um almost like a genre sense it was more just like the the feelings of movies generally that you were able to internalize into a dream space do you feel like you can tell the think... middle of a dream hmm? can you tell the middle point in a dream no, no, I don't think I could. I think when you start writing down your dreams, they get longer and longer and the structure kind of uh, isn't so great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then this happened, then that happened. Actually, if you're doing that, you're really just, um, if you get really good at that, you're probably, you're just basically recording like a, um, your, your thoughts basically. Yeah, that's interesting. Because I feel like one thing that is curious is that so much of the way that people recount dreams has this like really forward propulsive momentum that feels more like the way that a child describes having seen a movie than the mm -hmm. way somebody who can like sort of holistically approach what has happened 
right? Yeah. As if in, in, the, in that moment of remembering it. And so that, that makes sense what you're saying also about it sort of like getting longer and longer because you're all of a sudden like now remembering this like micro, the kind of like the little individual steps that led from one thing to another. Yeah. That's, That's really, true. I wonder if the you could that a story, The difference between that, a bunch of stuff happening in a story is a, a story has um, some sort of structure to help you understand to give meaning to um, all, all the all the things that are happening. Yeah. And what are the things that, depending on how you were telling, I mean, I guess also with the dream, there's no such thing as like spoiling it for the other person. And so there's no impetus to be like- Because they really don't care. <laughs> they don't care, but also like whatever the, the sort of the mystery is being like, no, you can just tell me, I uh, literally cannot experience this. So there's no reason for you to hold out on yeah. it. <laughs> Um, I kind of do like hearing people's dreams because then it gives you, um, you can come up with your own story of what they're going through. Yeah. Um, like, say, say, like say a friend of mine was having a dream where he was married to his mother. Like what would you be thinking of maybe? Um, he's probably, um, you know, afraid of becoming his father <laughs> <laughs> or reliving reliving that nightmare that is your own family again that sounds pretty good who is this guy <laughs> he's he's a celebrity oh cool but the thing about celebrities is that i just read this article where they said that they were um just like us which is sort of interesting you know you know sadly they are you know what i mean and that's the disappointing thing about them I agree. I've been thinking recently about how little I want that to be the case, how much I would prefer that there is some sort of like um, ineffable genius. And that's like part of what's happening. Or this person is a lunatic that essentially could not exist in society outside of their ability to preternaturally do accents and be somebody else, but they're blank on the inside. And you'd be like, ugh, just like me. I really yeah, gross. <laughs> that's everyone I know. Ugh. I would hang out with them. Yeah, yeah, because well, of course you would. They're just like you. <laughs> <laughs> I would hang out with whatever. Um, you, so, 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 I guess I'm curious just to hear more about the, the sort of the cycles of dreams when you were in these these phases of writing them down all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of the the lure of lucidity in terms of lucid dreaming. Um, do you think that it, it changed the way that you were dreaming to be thinking about them? Like in the way that maybe, I don't know, when, when a person starts to talk about art all the time, their art starts to change, or they start to talk about movies all the time or something like that. Like, do you feel like there was a self-consciousness or just an ability to see, like the sensorium was opened up? Like what changes in those moments of attention? Oh yeah, you pick up, when you do this exercise, you pick up more and more detail. Um, but you also have more control over them. And if you have more f freedom over it, I feel like it's less, uh, you're less um, emotionally at the mercy of them. So do you really want that? You know what I mean? I was thinking about this earlier on today in preparation for this, that uh, a friend of mine got really good at it, lucid dreaming and, um, and I think it's just um, kind of, it sounds like it just kind of becomes like a video game and you can fly around and stuff and do whatever you want. I think it's kind of lame. Why would you want to control that? Um, it would be, I guess it would be fun for a little bit, but it just seems like, um, I don't know. Why not just uh, surrender to it and get, um, I think about them, I guess when I think about this now, yeah, I'm thinking about um, I'm feeling emotional stuff in my body, processing in my sleep and stuff like that. And like crying and stuff like that, which I think I've done a couple of times. Either it's like really felt like it and I really have and like, wow, this is crazy. Mm. But I don't, you know, I'm not really crazy, it's just, sounds like um 
something is happening. Yeah. Well, it seems like I mean, the, something is happening in the background that you don't have control over. <clears throat> yeah. So then, I mean, that's interesting also to think then about in that way that maybe you were saying it's kind of like a video game. And of course, we were talking about movies already. And there is a way that lucid dreaming does seem like it is an attempt to kind of make that interactive and to sort of show sort of a different kind of agency inside that space, like very much equivalent to video game cinema kind of ideas. But I like also that idea that you're saying that there's a way that being at the at the at the will or at the mercy of the thing allows you to actually process these things. It's kind of like your subconscious is telling you what to do as opposed to giving you too much freedom in that moment, which actually then allows those emotional processes to happen. Yeah, it seems like you'd be uh you're um repressing more things by not letting your brain rest and do whatever it's supposed to do. Yeah. You know, I imagine it's weirder. I do remember like being partial. I do remember one weird dream where I was half. Um, half uh, lucid and I went, there was a while where I would only have dreams in my parent, in my old, my, my parents' house where I lived for like a, like too long a time, like I moved out really late. Um, I would only have dreams in there and it pisses me off so much because I like spent so much time trying to move out of there. <laughs> um, but I think it's like hard, it's definitely this one house is hardwired permanently in my brain. It's um, a place where um, that like represents the inside of um, my uh, consciousness. Um, and what the hell was I gonna say? Oh yeah, and I ran across the street to this one house and the, and I snuck in there and I remember they had a, um, see, this is the point where it's boring. This is an interesting, it's just a profound, uh, just like an image I have in my head that I can't get rid of. And I've tried to duplicate it in uh, by using 3D modeling and thinking it was a good idea. But I could, but it was like a balcony on a second floor inside the house. Like there'd be bedrooms off of, not a balcony, but a walkway and and down the middle of the, um, on the first floor, you could just see the family watching like a widescreen TV and all those blue light was just flashing and you could, mm. I was just kind of spying on them. But I have a lot of dreams of finding uh, new rooms upstairs in my parents, or I used to in my parents' house and um, in the basement, sometimes where there's often a lot of spiders and I have a lot of problems with spiders in the basement that I'm fighting. And uh, are those, th th those new rooms are often, they're not necessarily pleasurable spaces. They're filled with spiders and things like that. The basement's always filled with spiders. Upstairs usually is like cool stuff. Um, like a skylight room and but it's hard to get in hard to get up there it's like a rickety ladder or a, a dangerous way to climb up there mm -hmm. basement is usually like endless infestation and this is all like you know pretty standard up and down philosophical up up and down stuff down low is dirty and rancid up is cool and uh, clean. Yeah, and also you can't really have a skylight room in the basement. And yeah, it's just practical stuff. You can't really have a skylight in the basement. Yeah, like you said. Um, but you know, I mean, the, the, the idea of moving, of having these sort of um, finding hidden rooms and having spaces that, that open up in familiar spaces is like a common dream thing. We've even had it on the show so far. And one thing that I'm sort of interested about with that that's funny is that your house where you live now, not your parents' house, does have more than any place I've maybe ever been, the feeling mm -hmm. that there's a secret door that leads to a totally open, brand new, strange space. That's true. In my uh, apartment I have now, I live in, it's a super cool arrangement where both, there's two units, our unit and the landlord, landlord's unit, and it's all on one floor. And 
It's divided in half by a wall. Um, so if you go into a pantry, there's a tiny door that opens up and that tiny door leads to the pantry of our landlord. It's uh, so cool. also... A mere image of the two apartments. It's really cool. Um, and we watch each other's cats. And um, it is definitely like a Michelle Gondry situation <laughs> or something. Yeah, but that also makes you wonder, like, why don't more houses, because it's not like this is was designed by some star architect. It's like, why are there not more flourishes like that? Like, what a good idea to have mirror house and that it's all done through this tiny little portal to this scale. They should. Um, the, the legend goes is that it was, this uh, property used to be owned by two sisters so that they would, one would be in front and the other one would be in back. Huh. I like yeah. that somehow the, the fact that they're sisters makes the mirroring seem like, oh, well, that's the reason for it. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes perfect sense why they do that. <laughs> Because people, if you're a bro if you're a brother and sister, or, you know, if you're related to someone, you usually live with them <laughs> in one building. But mirror, not like, not in a weird way. Right. Yeah, and the person with the more outgoing personality lives in front, and the person that's more shy lives in back. Do the cats ever uh, go from one apartment to the other, and does that confuse them to be like? Yes, the cat. Them? Our cat tries to sneak in back. But he is an, he's like a nerdy cat. He has asthma. Someone declawed him, not us. And um, he's not an outdoor cat. The cat in back is a buddy. He's really tough. He's huge. He doesn't give um, a, a swear word about anything. He's an outdoor cat. And we sometimes let him, we often, he claws on our door and we let him in through our house to the back door, but we can't let our cat wizard go from one room to the other. Um, yeah. Here's a fun synchronicity is Aaron and I were just watching um, this movie called The Dark Past and it's um, film noir about this psychiatrist who is um, in a cabin with, uh, it's a film noir in a cabin with um, his family and friends or something like that an escaped convict invades their cabin and uh, holds them captive. And Aaron's finishing the movie in the other room. And the therapist is trying to psychoanalyze him. <clears throat> and the therapist is like uh, asking him questions about stuff. His, the, the criminal's hand is, is paralyzed in the is Satan in the Satan uh, formation. Yeah. yeah. And um, they talk about his dream and he has a dream where he, everywhere he goes, he's covered in, it's raining and everywhere, it keeps, the rain keeps getting more and more intense. And then he finds an umbrella. This is his repeated dream he has, this movie that we were just watching. Um, there's a hole in the umbrella and he tries to cover the hole up with his, um, paralyzed hand and all the rain keeps coming through and then he he looks around even more and he realizes that he's in jail <clears throat> huh yeah what do you think about the use of um of dreams in in fiction like i mean in particular in films like that as a convention i hate it you hate it i do i really do i think movies are already like enough we don't need it it's never Exciting movies themselves are the dream already. Dream sequences are overkill. We don't need it. Don't do it. It's boring. So what about now? We're getting into like I guess the lightning round, which we haven't had yet. Um, what yeah. about using dreams as the sort of like the fodder for the film, like the the the, the whole film being from a dream or, for, or using dream logic even? I hate that even more because that's just an extended dream. Like I say, the movie is the dream already. It's already full of weird things that we want to see and people acting weird and strange. We don't need it. I don't get it. Do you ever um, make sculptures in your dreams? Um, no, no, never. 
No. One time I, I was, I felt like, I think a lot of people have had dreams where they've like learned a new skill that they didn't realize they had in the dream they're doing it. Like they become a music, became a musician. I remember having a dream where I became like a really good rapper. <laughs> and I was just joking around and I think it was like really good at rapping at everyone and it oh. felt so natural it all made sense in my dream like it was actually it was it was really happening you know what I mean yeah crack the cup mm. and then did, when you woke up were you I tried to rap I was like okay <laughs> here we go here and I was like give me a beat <laughs> I couldn't do it. That's what, do it. That is like um, in terms of skills that a person might pick up in their dreams and have a wholly different world. It's not. It's certainly adjacent to things that you do. Rapping, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I've always considered myself basically um, kind of like a rapper, but with um, images and sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> and writing. I mean, it's basically the same, same thing. And that's true. I think if I got, um, I think if I hit my head in a certain way, I could. I don't think I have guitar. I think I could definitely rap if I got um, a certain kind of brain. If a rail went into my skull, <laughs> just just the right way, <laughs> it cut away um, some of the uh, impulse control, and but also hit the part that. Um, but also like uh, supercharge the part that has to do with like language. Yeah, the rhyme. That's actually, what I, I, they did. They did some, um, and this is not true. But the, I think the Genius.com did some like MRIs, and rappers have a really big the 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 rhyme. Yeah, the the rhyme part is really big. I don't know. It's just what I heard. But it makes sense. <laughs> Wait, there's just how big is that rhyme part? It's, really, it's, it's like really big on rappers. It's like a three three inch by three inches of everyone's brain. It's actually rhyming. It's underused. Um, I remember watching this Ice T um documentary about rapping that was really fun, and uh, he's interviewing one guy who raps, and he's like, Ice T's like, man, that was an amazing flow. It was like he was a rap about um like the Illuminati or something like that. <laughs> and uh, I don't even know who the guy was. He's, and he's like, man, what's, how do you prepare for, for rapping? He's like, you know what, man, honestly, I just get really hungry. It's like hungry. He's like, yeah, I just don't eat. And I get really hungry. Huh. And I said, that's, well, I don't know. And it's <laughs> also like a dieting. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe that works. I do think about that. Whenever I have to um, rap, I try not to <laughs> before I end. <laughs> so. That's interesting though. I'd be very curious to see if that's something that works for all other parts of that person's life or if that's just like rap specific because that has something to do with the mouth. Like if that person, I don't know. I mean, do you feel like if you don't eat before you go to the studio that you have like that the hunger moves from being physical to metaphorical and like this desire for success and for meaning or something like that? Like, or does it just make you cranky and lightheaded? It makes me cranky and angry. This guy was probably like, you know, he was rapping about, um, you know, I'd have to look it up. I watched this, uh, you know, like 10 years ago, but I feel like it was, um, if you don't eat, um, yeah, you get more confrontational because you're, you know, if you were a hunter gatherer, you'd be, the heat is on, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you got to, you, if things aren't working out and you're really hungry, you might have to wrestle an elk to, to death with your bare hands uh -huh. instead of hunting it. So like maybe if words are like, um, <clears throat> the weapons we use now on social media, Twitter, <laughs> Um, to protect our, to feed our families, uh -huh. then it makes sense. Um, but I don't think anger is, yeah, poison. A friend of mine was trying to show me um, clips of like the 
the White House being ransacked by, um, I think it was, I didn't really listen to the story, but I think they were trying to get like the copper wiring on the walls or something. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention because I don't, I can't, I don't have the time to to watch that BS. I have other things. The world demands more of me than to be riled up by this. By well, these meth heads. Totally fake garbage the news puts out. <laughs> And, um, but anyways, he's showing this clip. I was like, I don't want to, wa- I'm trying, I don't want to be angry. It makes my heart race. It makes me more panicked. And I can, and I can survive by not watching all of the crazy crap people put on the internet. That's just me though. You know, what, what do I know? Yeah. Well, do, does the news of the day find its way into your dreams? No, it's all so, right now the news is all so like literal and unmysterious, it seems. You know what I mean? There's nothing to ponder over. It's, it seems so concrete and clear. There's nothing, you're, the back burner of your brain needs to chew on because everything is so polarized and stupid. All right, that's a pretty good answer. But yeah, I don't know. But I don't, uh, I'm just working on it. That was a rant. I'm really hungry right now. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking very. Is that your. Uh, in an unnuanced, con- a conclusive kind of way. You know what I mean? But a good also, a good practice for, for when you're on talk shows is to not eat for a while so that you get really combative, right? I think you just have to, I don't know. It probably makes for better entertainment if we were arguing with each other about something you know what i mean mm-hmm. you a- look like you're in um did you ever seen S- sleeper yeah the woody allen movie yeah I, i've only seen parts of it but you have like a kind of a 70s clean look about you right now uh-huh <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's supposed to sort of feel um, like it's somewhere in between like a suit and pajamas. <laughs> are your pa- what kind of pants are you wearing? They're like jeans. Corduroy. They're like you know like denim fabric, but this is this is like camel hair, so it's very soft. Oh, okay, soft. They sort of match, you know. I mean the you know the budget for the shows shrunk a little bit than I was sort of uh, told initially. So it was sort of a come as you are kind of thing. But then these these shoes I think are pretty like... You know, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Extremely sleepy. There's some of our more sort of like eagle eye uh, audience members have noticed that I, I change shoes uh, throughout the run of the show, but let's not get the, the fan theories. So I am very interested to see uh, how those shake out. Um, but on that note, let me just say, Mike, Mike Lopez, thank you so much for being on the late, 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 late show. It's been a real pleasure and sweet dreams. Wow, this was fun. Uh, sweet dreams to you. Uh, and, um... I hope you have some cool dreams. Every night I, you should go to sleep and um, just count your blessings, count what you're grateful for. Best way to get to sleep, be like, wow, oh, what am I grateful for? You wake up in the middle of the night, just talk about what am I grateful for? You know what I mean? You'll be able to knock yourself out and have some weird dreams where you're crying and coming sort of, I read everything's getting resolved and you can just let it all go. You know what I mean? We gotta let that hate go. We got, we got to use, first you got to feel the hate and the anger. That's fine. You don't feel guilty about it. Then let it go. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's beautiful. And great advice for the youth. Yeah. All right. Good night, Mike. All right. Bye. Bye. People always think, people always think, Snow doesn't dream, snow couldn't dream.
We do, we do, we dream about being rain, we dream about being coyotes. Well, 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 welcome back to the late, 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 late show. I remain your host, J-E, triple Z-E, M-A-L-M-E-D. On the show tonight, got an old friend of the program, someone who even has a couple, two, three Z's in her name. I speak, of course, a filmmaker, professor, artist, writer, keen observer of the visual world, our shared world, our living world, with a little tweak, but let's hope gives us a chance for her to give us some insight into maybe the dream space. So if you will, please put your pajama little tootsies together for Nelly Clues. Okay. How's it going? Good evening, Nelly. Good evening. Can you hear us? Yeah, I think so. Can you hear me? Can I hear you? You know, I, I think it, it turns out I was um, the other kind of muted, where the camera, by which I mean the computer, was muted. Hello, Nelly. Hey, great to see you. Great to be seen and to see. This is one of the few moments when we can say good night as a greeting. So good night, Nelly. How are you? Good night. I'm well. I uh I actually am actually getting a second wind. I'm feeling really wakeful. Uh so you're saying this is not a good time? No, no, this is perfect. <laughs> but I just think I might continue being awake after this for like a couple more hours. Great. Well, so Nelly. I've been curious and the audience has voiced their interest and curiosity and you telling us a little bit about what your dream life has been like recently. Well, um, my dream life is only possible to know about if I um, am in a good journaling habit, which I've been trying to be recently. And I was just looking through my own notebooks for uh, art for uh, entries that start with the dream that I had. Um, so I've been I've been betwixt in between and around different places, but um, the dreams have been they've been a little bit anxious, and I've noticed that they take place in a lot of different a lot of different um, settings not too recurring huh. very very all over the place Places but fun ones okay um yeah so i mean i had a good twist on the classic um going back to high school dream the other day where it was like me having to go back to my high school but I, they actually, so my high school had like uniforms and in this dream, they actually changed the uniforms to be really cool. Like I really, I really they were like cool colors and patterns and it was like really appealing to me. So I was kind of like going along with it. Cause I was like, oh, I like that sweater is actually like 
really cool <laughs> and, like, and like it's like sort of like green and like the the palette is like really like interesting and so I had all these new uniform clothes that I was like getting ready to wear and then at the last minute I was like no way like I already w went to high school <laughs> I'm not going back but um I think it's related to some clothes shopping I've been doing so that and, was one back yeah season, maybe what and back to school season it is almost back to school season yeah um, I often have anxiety dreams about school and work, but those haven't kicked in yet because I'm having a nice restful uh, break. But when you were saying that these that these things take place all over, there are places that you have often been or that they are, are new to you or? Well, I was looking through my, my uh, notebook from the past six months or so when I've been mostly in Iowa, but I was, I'm in New York right now and I was here a little bit in the summer. And so one that I had a while ago, it must have been after Borat 2 came out because the dream was that I was in LA going to <laughs> the Big Apple Circus live version of Borat 2 <laughs> with two people that I know, some friends. And I was wearing a Borat costume, but it was cash only. <laughs> like they went in and I was like no, no I'll go get cash I'll go get cash but then I like wandered a post-apocalyptic landscape of like LA where I've been like one time and I, I it's not like someplace I'm that familiar with um and it got really scary and there was like dead um like bodies everywhere wow yeah so that was one I had about very bi-coastal because then one very bi-coastal but also very much I mean, interested in, in ways that I think you also are in other ways of like the the thing that is fake, but intervening in the world, turning into the thing, but then is like celebrating its artifice, like a yeah. live circus version of this man in the street style mockumentary is a very <laughs> good idea. And then and the person who are real in that moment, but would be acted. Uh, and then the yeah. you. And I, for some reason, am bringing another level of costuming <laughs> as an audience member. Did you, did you think that you were dressed like that in the kind of um, like Rocky Horror Picture Show way where you dress up as your favorite character or was it that you were maybe actually Borat or? <laughs> I was definitely an audience member. Like it felt really casual. Like I was like, what are we going to kind of thing? Like, uh, yeah, oh, it's like a play, <laughs> but it's like, a, it's a big apple circus. Oh, that's so <laughs> And then another one I had someone on a similar note uh back in october was i dreamt that i was homeless in nyc having a creepy affair with the actor ryan o'neill but i like, couldn't tell anyone about it uh he's not even an actor i ever think about who is he he's like um maybe it's just maybe i don't even have his name right but i think he's he's tatum o'neill's dad huh uh Please he's go. like <laughs> He's, um, he was like a 70s, he's from Barry Moon, he's from Paper Moon and Barry Lyndon. Okay. okay. Like he plays Barry Lyndon. Yeah. <laughs> That's oh, Barry. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was like a stressful one. Wait, wait, and then, whatever yeah. that, what was he like, how old was he in the, in the stream? I don't think he was in it, honestly. It was just like one of those things where you like know that that's the situation. Like there's that's the setup, and then a lot of other stuff happens. And were you? Um, it's tell me this is too personal, but were you in that moment having an affair with a famous actor in the seventies, or is that too literal a connection? I think it. I think unfortunately for me, it was too literal a connection. There's, there's sometimes dream analysis. I think maybe I went. Out. It's not, you know. I love those uh, shoes, by the way. Thank you. Speaking of the 1970s. Like, <laughs> you, can, you can dress them up. You can dress them down. Oh, There's wow. Dress them up, dress them down. Roll them up, roll them down. <laughs> gotcha. Um, okay, the only other dream I wanted to share before maybe making some connections, because these are the ones that I found. Um, and it's another one that goes into another place, basically. Dreamt I was chilling out in a stranger's garden, drinking coffee and listening to sound art. 
I was so comfortable that I just got up to pee in their yard, at which point they appeared and in a very British restrained way confronted me. <laughs> and were like, who are you? What are you doing? And that was when I was Wisconsin Dells. And I think that one was, I was like dealing with strangers and very stressed about it. And like, it was COVID and I was like, what are you doing? Like, what? Like, you can't use the bathroom anywhere. <laughs> you have to so those are my three dreams in different places um those are great so it's been, been a stressful stressful six months <laughs> i only write down ones that are like funny i never really have i feel like if i have um yeah other dreams i either don't remember or they're too intense or something or it's like not fun to write down so i just don't and then i completely forget do you have to write them down immediately upon waking or do you talk them out or how do you sort of like- I either would have to write it down or maybe text it to a friend. Um, but then I think if, you te if I text it or tell it as an anecdote it becomes way more flat. Like if I'm writing it down, I'll do a whole little paragraph with and I'll kind of like extrapolate a little bit and like maybe like connect it to something or be like, oh, I think this is, you know, related to that you know, it's only good, it's only good to tell a friend if it's like kind of a one-liner, like, dream. And I don't have that many of those, really. I don't think there's not that many funny situations that happen that are like really easy to explain. So I do have to write them down immediately, which is part of like, you know, it's a constant struggle for me to not like, because I love when I'm, when I'm writing three pages a day in my little notebook but um sometimes I don't have the discipline so the dreams are a good like hook because it's like well now I'm here I'm writing this down might as well you know jot down some other thoughts so that's most excited for it's also a good thing to be like maybe as long as I'm here I'll write down things that have actually happened maybe that could be <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, like what did I do yesterday? Yeah, exactly. Um, and then do you, I mean, uh, when those things happen, I mean, outside of you sort of like describe that that uh, common trope of sort of being able to recognize in particular a work or school anxiety dream, but do you otherwise, I mean, do you try to kind of experience them as something that is meant to be analyzed and picked apart? Is it more about just the sort of, um, I don't know, like the the humor that happened, the strangeness that happened, or, or do you see them as something that like you're trying to then kind of figure out and decode? I think some are just like glaringly obvious. Like sometimes with my subconscious, I'm like, oh, you dreamed you weren't ready for class. <laughs> like, like it's just sort of like, and you uh, weren't, or like you got you. <laughs> get enough sleep or like I feel like if I'm not sleeping well and I'm really stressed about things I might I don't get I'm not deep enough into sleep to have really cool dreams like my I don't have the time even while I'm asleep my brain doesn't get there because I'm like shallowly resting so I, I think those ones are never as cool as like I'm never because I'm usually only ever moved to write down a, like I'll try to get into the habit of it but I don't unless it's like funny or like vivid, I don't always do it. So those are usually just kind of fall to the wayside for me. Interesting. Yeah, like too obvious or like, just like, oh, my mom died <laughs> and it was really sad. <laughs> so yeah. like what? Um, are there like, not to be morbid, but if it's, if it's a dream like that, is that the kind of thing you would tell a person involved? Or do you feel like you only tell them when it feels like they had like a fun role in your dream? I think only if it was fun or like really weird. Uh, if only if they would think it was funny. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think I wouldn't tell a family member if I had a dream that something like terrible happened to them, which I don't often have. I don't think my family's in my dreams that much. It's usually like peripheral, more peripheral people or like friends. I never have, I almost never have like dreams about like people I work with. Uh, that's not true. But yeah, I, I feel like I don't, I don't usually have dreams about like close family members as much that I can think of. Are those peripheral friends often people that you 
upon waking realize that you sort of miss or want to see, or is it more that it feels like they they're filling some sort of like other role in the dream? I think it's easier for acquaintances or to like kind of be stand-ins or be like side characters. Um, so yeah, I think that like closer friends will will be a recurring cast, but then there's definitely people who I'm like, you know, actually one thing that's kind of messed up is like the merging of social media and dreams. Like I literally had a dream last week that freaked me out more than a lot of stuff that I was looking at Instagram. Like, in, like the dream took the form of me looking at Instagram and I was like, and I had been looking at my phone a lot um, that day or that few days. And I was just like, this is messed up because this is basically co-opting my dream life because it functions in a really similar way actually where you're just sort of wandering through the landscape yeah. and um and in that same way like peripheral social media people become like much more amped up or important to like the story in a way that like they and they take on like symbolism and stuff in a way that's like completely out of proportion so i feel like it's a similar um like casting yeah. process but with that colonizing of the mind were there all were there still ads in dream instagram yes yes it was like all was it, ads <laughs> were, they, were they targeted towards uh things that like previous dreams you've had or things that are like not part of your waking life but your dreaming life targeted ads honestly i think they were just like still ads for clothes <laughs> like, like on this one stupid thing that i look at where people sell their clothes that i get ads from constantly or was it, it's actually was it very frustrating clothes? because they've now learned what kind of clothes I like, but they constantly show them to me days after they've been posted and other people have already bought them. <laughs> so it, like the algorithm has learned, but like it doesn't work like that because it's like used clothes. So it's like, there's only one thing. So I can't yeah. like get it. <laughs> oh my God, that's so good, right? The food is so bad and the portions are so small. Like this, it's so invasive and at least get it right. My goodness. I feel like the other yeah, person- know, Like at least allow me when they advertise to you something that you just bought and being like, look, first of all, not that impressed by your algorithm because I literally, all we know is that I bought it. The other thing we know is that I just bought it. Like who buys oh, yeah. it? <laughs> an hour later, you're like, I haven't gotten it yet, but I just have a feeling about these Q-tips that this is like a year long endeavor I want to go in on. Exactly. Um, so Nelly, how, how do you, do you, have you, how do you integrate your, dreams into your creative practice into your filmmaking do you find have you borrowed things from that space do you find that it reveals things to you is that another sort of space of editing or reflection for you you know actually a little bit but the only example i recently i think i did a thing one time where i like incorporated it into like voiceover but then i ended up ditching the voiceover i think it's good for like background writing about like what you might want to get at or like cool images that come up but I mostly just use it as like like I was saying kind of like a prompt for trying to you know make myself write more consistently um but I did have this one dream when I was working on this project that I'm making right now that like I had a dream that either me or someone else no I had a dream that a friend of mine made another version of my movie that was so much better and it was so like good like it was like unreal it was like the coolest video game you've ever seen and like hauntingly beautiful <laughs> it was like but it was like so different than it wasn't like a doc like i'm making about this place it was like the coolest like vr lavish thing and i kind of woke up and was like I got to do that. Like, I, like, I kind of like, was like, you know, you're, you're too, you're too thinking by the book. Like you gotta, you know, you gotta go for think about the effect that you want and try to achieve it. Don't let yourself be limited by like the footage you have. And then after I wrote it down after a few minutes, I was like, no, this is just like a weird dream about the dynamic that you have with this person. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, that's it was like, quite lovely though. But, but, there, yeah. but there weren't any moments from it that you felt like you could poach. Be like, Honestly, yeah. there was this one like 
I might be able to do something. I might be able to get like, not with what I've got now, but I, I do think that the the grand feeling could maybe be achieved. Like I could get some like VR like frames, like you know, <laughs> you know like the the like you know sometimes it's sort of like a mesh in the computer mm -hmm. and you're like zooming around. As you can tell by the way I'm describing it, I'm not really like into that kind of thing, but like I could do something like that, um, or at least. Or at least do some cool editing so that you're a little bit disoriented. I think it helps me be a little less straight laced sometimes to be like, no, literally dream bigger. Oh, but another dream I had was, oh my God, this is like an example of one that's way too literal to, to even discuss. But like during the filming process, when I was in Wisconsin Dells making this movie, they like, I had a dream that I literally had to go to a filmmaking workshop with Fred Wiseman. <laughs> and then we all had to go on a bus together and we had to go on like these fairground rides and it was like kind of stressful and i and i was like that's the opposite i woke up feeling tired of what i was doing so it's nice dreams that inspire you to do something completely different yeah though i mean do you feel like you learned something from him in that moment or was it just uh no it was just like because i listened to a radio interview with him earlier that day and I literally had gone to an amusement park. I was like not sleeping. <laughs> I was like not sleep, and I was like doing interviews. Like I had not slept deeply enough, and it just like maybe that's the thing where like maybe maybe I just like I uh, I know when I'm when I'm like my own like lame dreams. If I'm not working enough on something to make it like try and make it complex and like you know do something really cool, then it's like phony. You can't be phoning it in. Dream was. Dreamwise, then you can extrapolate that, I guess. Sort of, like, whatever, not really. No, but that's a very interesting thing to also use. Uh, I feel like there's so many ways people make use of their dreams or be fuddled by them or something like that, but to use it more, less about sort of like diagnosing the emotional state the one's in based on reading the symbols, but more uh, the, the quality of what they're doing by how interesting their dreams are. And that can maybe go either way. Maybe there's people that like the, the times when they're most sort of engaged in the world, then it really is like, it's nice to have a dream about something boring, like somebody mm. like, you know, who actually does whatever they do in Call of Duty, maybe really likes to play Tetris, but somebody whose job it is is to move bricks around really wants to like play a soldier game or something. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, actually though, my friend was just telling me a recurring, her main childhood recurring dream was being a world Tetris champion. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh my God. That's I am really good at Tetris actually, but I don't know if I was like world champion material. I feel like for a lot of those kinds of things that to be a world champion would actually not be that fun. Like it's, it would be, it's really nice to be like quite good at something like that. And then to be better than that, I feel like you're just sort of like processing it as like sheer data moving through you or something like that. Like you want to have a little bit of, yeah. you know, like the, the Tuesday crosser puzzle is more fun than the one for children at the dentist's office and being like, Apple, this is so easy, you know? So maybe there's something about that with Tetris, I don't know. I know it's like with, um, I got into playing some, a little bit of ping pong with my dad because he got a set where you can like transform your dining room table into a ping pong table and um we're both really bad at it I, and he was just like you know when you see the people who are world champions it's like it's like they're not even it's just you can't see the ball it's just back and forth and I was like what are you getting at like we're we're not even able to volley the ball <laughs> or like we don't understand what the point structure is <laughs> we're not gonna get to that level yeah, and there is that, that, that um, chasm between, and that's then, yeah. probably the sweet spot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were kind of, it got kind of fun. I mean, it was fun to like move around instead of just watching movies. And I was with my family. Um, so that was nice. How, so have you noticed any change in your dreams since you moved to this new place? Um, uh, I had a little bit of, well, okay. I think I told you I'm, I'm in this place now that has, I think my sleep is a little bit like muddier and more confusing because 
I don't get light in the mornings very much because there's it's a it's a garden level and I keep the blinds closed at night because otherwise people like at one, at one point an old person just came by and like looked in for like a long time when I had them open because wow. they're like curious to see what I was doing um in the morning so I don't want to have them open at night or in the morning but it's fine yeah anyway so it's it's all good but like I am just sleeping a little bit later in the mornings and like I feel like you know like a lot of people probably I only really remember the last dream I had before waking up so it's that part of the day has become a little bit more strange yeah um and a bit uh, I got to find that sweet spot with how that's going to work out. Do you dream of you nap? Yeah. And usually those dreams are like the saddest. Hmm. Do you dream of you nap? Yeah, but I almost never nap. Wise. Yeah, as an old wise man said, I think it was Frederick Wiseman. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think that I, I, I sort of wish that I napped more often, but I forget or I like drink coffee instead or you know what I mean but it's actually I think it's like a very it's like an interesting reset um to your day or it's a way of like living twice as long or something life hack I don't know I got into a bad habit like this past year some like at certain points because I because I, I don't know I feel like my energy levels got really out of whack where I was like uh, several times I watch I would like watch um five episodes of like the Sopranos or like get done with work or class or something watch like five episodes of Sopranos start napping at like five and wake up at nine and a p.m and then just be up until like 4 a.m so those aren't good <laughs> I, I I really enjoy messing up uh, like occasionally just like completely obliterating a healthy schedule like yeah. very occasionally for like for a couple weeks but then it starts to get to you so you have to get back yeah um, there's a way that also i mean but yeah isn't that it? what well and i think there's also something that's like related to that with working remotely with covid with all these like various things of, of feeling like that that's at least a, a way of sort of playing with a uh a really disjunctive time sense is to be like well Let's try this out. And yeah, as long as I love it. And then it also then feels like the, it turns out that the pressures of the world are actually much more synchronous than I thought. Like on, on days when you're only, in a world in which your only activity is going for a walk, it's really nice to be up when it's light out. <laughs> yeah. And there's all these things that just like are not, you know, turns out there's a reason why so much of the world has been organized around like light. <laughs> <laughs> like certain, certain, uh physics yeah stuff. as much as i feel like it's yeah i know i'm especially feeling but but there was some big um some major moons recently oh, that yeah. i mean you don't have to be up that late to see them you can see them at like nine o'clock so was, but it was still like the excite the the natural the nature excitement of the day was at night and that was cool yeah, and I and I did on those nights. I like stayed up late. Then I like set another alarm to have like a, a sort of an inverted nap to be awake for twenty minutes in the middle of the night to like look at the things. And did you catch much? No, but there's so many stars here that it's like it's cool to look at it anyway. It feels it, it's like the, the version of like being in a big city and being like you're going on a walk, not to the destination. It's just like there's like a vast sensorium. So even though I didn't really see that thing, it was like. Well, there's so much to see and my knowledge of all these things is so scant that like why was I looking for this one like it's all interesting you know it's all uh yeah, yeah. it's lush it's, it's, uh, I, don't, I, I haven't gone on any walks at night well I did walk a really long time the other day because I confidently just like walked in the wrong direction for like half an hour <laughs> I, like have to just like it was like a whole thing. That's great. Yeah. Um, well, Nelly, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, I've loved it. This is so fun. Such a delight. So any, any last words for the audience about dreams or projects you want to plug or dreams you want to suggest people having? 
have it have ne ne never settle <laughs> never settle and as you said earlier dream bigger yeah dream dream no not dream bigger but dream better <laughs> oh wow don't work harder work smarter that's actually my thing for this year that's your 2021 it has been working it's been i've had mixed results that's good. I like, I feel like it's also, is that like a, I mean, it's, it's a lot of things, but it's also probably a slogan for a business, which I like of being like 2021, think different. <laughs> Just thought of it. <laughs> yeah, they haven't, it's been pretty similar. I don't know. <laughs> like, so. yeah. Well, we could say maybe uh, Just Dream It. Field of Dreams. Iowa. That's actually, I'm making a movie about Iowa right now and it involves Field of Dreams. So maybe that's what I'll end on, but I, I don't want to talk about it. It's too complicated to explain. Uh, well, we'll have you back because maybe the next talk show will be all about Iowa. Um, great, hit like, me up. I feel like I'm the person to do it. <laughs> yeah. Like I've been there, have I been there? I can never remember if I've been there, you know what I mean? But welcome back to, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, you know? Uh, okay. Well, thank you so much. It could be all one favorite. Yeah. Thank you for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure. Uh, it's great to see you. Sweet dreams. Dream bigger. Sweet dreams. Bye. Bye. That was Nelly Clues. Silence. I. I dream of silence a lot. What's up? Well, I actually just uh, I accidentally recorded the intro without recording it. I didn't record it. So do you mind if I just record the intro you weren't supposed to be there for? Okay, yeah. So you want to can't you kick me out? No. Yeah. Just, oh, okay. Just just pretend you're backstage. Okay. I mean, it's not that formal. Okay. So we're just so excited to have our next guest on the program tonight. Alex Bradley Cohen is an artist working across all kinds of different forms, maybe mostly painting, but also in ceramics and drawing and performance and collage and sculpture. And sometimes also like tonight, perhaps in dream analysis or long form, free form, concept and form, content and form based discussion. Welcome, Alex. How are you? Sleepy. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. It's, um, I mean, by some standards, it's two weeks from now, very late at night. This is, yeah, yeah. Very late at night and um, just exhausted from the day the events of the day. It's an exhausting day. We haven't been uh, on the show talking much about that this is pre-filmed, but today was the day of the uh, attempted right-wing coup. I assume that's- Oh no. Not, you had like a, did you have a long day in other ways? Oh, I mean, I mean, the Kim Kardashian and Kanye West breakup, you know? Oh yeah, you're referring the to the two days after being dad gate it's been Being a busy year <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah no just like tired you know i'm ready to uh to get into some dreams so i wonder what i'm gonna dream about tonight yeah so how often do does the news of the day whether kanye based or uh trumpian how often does that find its way into your dreams um i think very rarely actually but it does find its way into my daydreams i actually think it was interesting because i was like i actually don't think i dream a lot but i do daydream a lot hmm. um dreams are so when i do dream they usually are these um they're usually these um, unfolding rooms and they are and i'm usually running from something and as I'm running, um, doors begin to open up 
And it's like, I'm running from room into room into room into room. And it becomes this kind of like endless experience or event of me being chased through all these different spaces. And that's usually for my whole life has have been the, the structure or the content of my dreams. Are these, are these spaces usually places that you sort of recognize, uh, but that they're sort of unfolding differently or they, or they always feel, uh, they're like, they're no, I mean, it's really interesting because I had, I had a really deep realization, uh, about a month ago about something that was happening in my paintings and, you know, usually they're like, there are rooms and they're empty rooms with like four walls and but the thing that separates each room is the is it's one a feeling and, and it's just the experience of of going through a door but those rooms are color blocked for sure hmm. like i'll be in a red room and then a blue room and the rooms are basically identically the same and this happened long before you, you were spending time in the white walled gallery spaces yeah <laughs> Interesting. So then are, are you often in those situations? I mean, you can identify the, the character being chased very much as, as you and as like your sort of waking life you. Yeah. And then and are, are the things that are chasing you? Is it, is it, is it something specific, but the changes or does it feel like it's like a, a force or a, I don't know, an anxiety or an energy or a ghost? It's an, yeah. I would actually rather use the word anxiety than like a spirit or something, you know? Like, I think it's a, yeah, it's definitely an anxiety, an anxiety, uh, of, it's fear-based. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So how then, I mean, you were, you were talking about this, uh, realization that you had during the day and with the color blocking, how do you feel like that impacts your, your creative practice and your work? That was a daydream. And it was about like, it was about a month ago. It, well, what I realized was that, um, around, I feel like about 20 from I would say from like 2014 to 2016 the paintings were really psychological uh, well yes the paintings were more psychological portraits of myself and there were like specific paintings of one that was titled headspace and it was kind of like the back of my head in this sort of psychological space that was made that was just for um wall like a it was like four paneled but it was a room and it was just each like the floor there was like a floor and then two walls and then a ceiling and then or i guess three walls and then a ceiling and each wall was a different color or each plane was a different color and early on i was in those rooms alone and then what then happened was that i began put it, you know, in the paintings, it began to be other people in those rooms. And so I think it, for me, it was about belonging in one sense, and a kind of seeing maybe my own fears and anxieties in others, and sort of representing that social bond, but also through maybe that social bond, seeing those anxieties that I experienced in myself within others. Hmm. If that makes sense. And then also there's like the sort of additional layer of that, that then the, the painting itself becomes something that moves from being yours and your sort of interpretation to being something that's like meant for an encounter with an audience. So there's like another element of the social and the, the bond in it. Yeah, yeah, because the paintings were so much, are, those paint like the portraits now that I'm going into from the past four years where yeah we're more about like a social bond and maybe a meshing of identities um than it was about like any sort of fixed identity or representation of a person so it became more about that bond and a social bond which is something that is I think you know it's funny because the key word of today has been democracy Donald Trump has been a threat to our democracy and, and our democracy is our social bond. And if the thing that binds us is this idea of democracy, then the, 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 the binding itself is totally in flux. 
you know yeah um because it is this thing that is forever changing and we have to we have to deal with that you know we have to tend with that thing that binds us as a thing that is unfixed and constantly maybe changing power um changing direction and changing form and being shaped by things outside of our things that are separate from us but that we are still bound to mm -hmm. that's really curious because also one of the things that's been interesting and in kind of talking with people about dreams also is the strange way that you know they exist entirely not only inside of our own minds and experience but also in a way that is sort of inaccessible even to ourselves slightly um, mm -hmm. and to think about that sort of next stage of whatever the thing is that is the um the bond the the space between the the synapse the webbing the link between two people um mm -hmm. and then often those people don't even have a full kind of control over or concept of their own their own self or what's happening inside of them like the the permeability it's very strange yeah Can you... yeah then i think the dreams in themselves um in a sense like it could be spirit or whatever you might want to call it energy or the, or the, maybe there's a time element in dreams right like obviously because it exists in our minds and in time or through time or throughout time where was i going with this hold on um, that there is i mean the dreams in themselves are always being unfolded to it like I actually, you know, what's weird is I actually don't really know a lot about dreams. Look, I haven't read a lot about dreams, but it is a thing that happens in time. So that, and I think in my dreams specifically, it's always like I'm, um, there is a, a, a an element of the unknown and something being uncertain to me. And I have to deal with that in the dream. The time thing is is wonderfully put also because I think that we um obviously we we all exist inside of time, but that um dreams are described in trajective, sometimes narrative terms in terms of what's you know, that it mm. whatever keeps unfolding and even including, I feel like often people sort of describe when they're meaning dream logic part of it is a mixture of sort of like what's happening in the frame, but also the way that things are moving through time and the sort of like the hinges between them, the sort of scenes, which is different, mm -hmm. I think, than when people talk about. People will often describe a thought as opposed to a process of thinking, something that has movement um, or mm -hmm. like an image or something like that, but that there is a way that it is really temporal. Um, that's really interesting and nicely put. Well, yeah. So, so can you talk a, a little bit to us about these? Uh, the daydream, or I mean, these are these are things where you're spacing out, or you're napping, or you you micro spacing. goes on sleep. Spacing or? out, yeah, spacing out. I mean, I think I've always done it, but now I've just not to say that they're, they're more intentional at all. Not at all. I think I have continued to do it as I've become even more aware of it, or just what it might mean, or but it just simply becomes a place for it really is just like imaginative thinking in a place where I'm able to have a conversation with myself and sort of uh, talk to myself and maybe work out things with myself. Um, but those, but it isn't entirely, a, 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 I guess, a selfish act because it's always related to what I'm going to do or how I'm going to do something. And so I think then my engagement is always altered by the daydream itself or the imaginative thinking that occurs inside of the daydream. So for me, the daydreams have, now that I'm just aware of them, are total, it's, it's totally an, ex, an imaginative exercise that always changes or has an effect on the way that, or has an effect on what I do and how I do it. Are they often um, 
is this like you are looking out the window, you go to the lake, is it when you're in the studio, is it all those kinds of things, or is it like, what is the sort of, uh, what are the actual things coming in through your eyes when these are happening and through your ears? Hmm. Uh, well, for, yeah, I think it just happens whenever, like it happens when I'm walking or grocery shopping. It's any act for the most part that is alone. Hmm. Um, it could occur in the shower, um, yeah, tying my shoes or what have you. And sometimes it's, it's, uh, it becomes an act of an, of a, it becomes an, an act of, a, of awareness when I become aware of something that maybe I just was never aware of or never thought or thought to think about. And the daydream, yeah, so the daydreams and what, it, <laughs> and for the most part, honestly, it's probably, um, so much about art and my own art for the most part. Um, and I'm always kind of thinking about it and what it means or um, what I'm doing and how can, I hate to be altruistic or something, but how can it affect, or what, what's it, well, yeah, how can it affect people? And what does it, what effect may it have on people? Um, so yeah, I think the daydreams for the most part, honestly, are directly um, related to my art practice. So then with that jump, how do you um, how do you find yourself integrating the sort of yeah, those kind of imaginative dream spaces, day or night, waking or sleeping, spacing, zoning out of it? How are those then? brought into the studio? Um, it's a, it's a search, it's a search for freedom. Um, and not being sort of, uh, held back by the unknown or held back by fear or shame. And so the ways that they find themselves into the studio is by letting kind of go of any sort of any fear or shame that I may hold. And so I think what happens, the radical act of what happens inside of the daydreams is this kind of accepting of things. And, and, and I think probably, and I think, yeah, I think humor plays a part in things that I do for the most part. Um, and, so what happens in the studio is kind of like um, allowing for a kind of improvisation and play to play out in the work, in the actual work, like what I'm doing in time, like a brush mark or a, a, a use of color or, or a shape or a form, like not being held back by any linear way of thinking because the daydreams in themselves are pretty much non-linear they kind of bounce from place to place and image to image or thought to thought um, and i think in that practice it then allows for my imagination to play out on the canvas in that same way. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So the paintings, so now I think like the paintings right now are really just juxtapositions of these danger of images that appear in my head and it. It's usually related to like an idea or something that maybe I had experienced before in the past and sort of just juck, um, making these paintings um, out of all these like disparate maybe experiences. Mm -hmm. And in their sort of um, like the little bits that I've seen from what you're working on right now, it also has this sort of uh, the fractured kind of like collage dream logic where they like they don't make sense together except that they must because they are together. So like ipso facto they do make sense together because they are or something like that. There's a way that there's a funny, um, I don't know, the way that it's like when someone says that something is in a word, it's like, 
I don't know. I think we both just recognize that as a word. <laughs> um, so that those those forms all of a sudden, in whatever this space is being constructed, they are together. It is both inside of a train and outside. Um, and that's not like a lot. Yeah, that matter of factness of a that that I that matter of factness is has actually been also really um interesting to me as like a as a tool or visual language it's like which i think was something that i was trying to get at for a while and i think the matter of factness was a way just like this is a hand and it's just a hand or this is a face and it's just a face and the and just then having to deal with these things that are constantly one in opposition to each other. Yeah, or it's not even one, just like that are in opposition or may appear to be in opposition are actually in relation um, ship to each other. Um, and then thinking about it from those terms and because the fact that they are in relate, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, that's, I would say that. It's the, 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 the accepting that things that are in opposition to each other is still a sort of relationship to each other. In fact, it's a, it's like a, such a specific one that is like the, the poles of magnetism are in some ways more, more direct, the, the handshape and the inversion of the handshape is like there's a, almost a stronger relationship than two things that are sort of like floating over here. Like yeah. It can be very, uh, but the but the floating like what do you wait what do you mean by floating oh just imagining like two things that take place in totally different parts of the sphere the world that those maybe uh -huh. have a less direct relationship than two things that are like necessarily in conflict even if they're oppositional mm. like that they they need each other in a different way or something like that that they like mm. produce the context for the other yeah yeah producing the context for the others yeah super important like they were like the way that uh that like cops and criminals both work in the same industry of of like crime together <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's re reciprocity yeah and it's reciprocity of yeah it's, i mean it's totally in painting it's definitely reciprocity of space it's um understanding that the space you take is the space it's something about like, um, I had a really clear thought recently. It was like, yeah, it's like the space you take informs the space that is made by like, or made for the other or something I like it. Like, yeah, they're totally like, we take space and we make up space and um, not only, yeah, like that space is also created by others and we create space for it's yeah it's it's totally just about reciprocity but it's not something that i'm also even it's like it just a I, it plays out in the paintings because it is something that i try to be aware of mm -hmm. and because of painting the paintings both have like a super discrete physical space like mm -hmm. and that that usually comes to you before you get it like the canvas is the space that it is yeah. And, but then can contain all this like deep metaphoric space or depictive space based on how you decide. To... Yeah, I mean, it's, the, it's a structure. Um, and then draw and then drawing in that space becomes a structure. So now there is a structure, which is the the structure is which is the the size of the canvas and the, the and then there's the structure that I implement that I'm in control of within that structure. And then, um, and so drawing becomes that structure. And then I would say color comes next. And now it's like this, now I, now I have to, like color becomes this really intuitive thing inside the maybe the other, this other intuitive thing. Like it's all actually, it's funny actually now I'm talking about it. Cause sometimes the, the canvas shape is really intuitive. Like I just will like, and so I'll just feel it out. And it's like the canvas is intuitive. And the drawing for the some, most part becomes kind of like intuitive. And then the color, because it's just like intuitive. It's like you are 
but it's structure simultaneously as this other thing that is free form. Mm -hmm. And it's like trying to balance both freedom and structure, um, where it's like the choice of the canvas in some ways is about, is a free choice, but that, that choice is now a structure. You know, and I can do what I want inside of that space, but now that space is a structure. And so it's just about how, like, you, yeah, it's, you know, it's funny because it gets so much back to democracy in a sense. The space that we're in right now, it's like, yeah, it's like you can create this structure and you have freedom inside of it, but it's still a structure that is created. And so it's like, what do you do when? that structure no longer works and you can no longer live within that structure is that you then have to create a new structure. And I think that is what is happening or like what is happening politically. It's like, yes, we have this structure and it is a, it is a structure that we have to live within, but it is also a structure that we have created. So how do we re begin to reimagine this structure that we are lit that we live within that we claim to be a structure of freedom when it is not actually allowing for freedom mm -hmm. you know like this structure doesn't actually allow for freedom even though we are looking like we're looking for the structure that allows for freedom well i think it's also the thing of like that the there, there are ways that some of these structures have revealed themselves to be um like just a series of agreements as opposed to a kind of a thing that actually is there. It's like everybody agreeing that the, this is, these are the walls of the house. And then it turns out that they weren't really there. It's like mimes, you know, it's like yeah. what some of the structures were. And then in other cases, people sort of like, I don't know, I, I feel like we are, in the way that you're describing the overlapping intuitions, it feels like there's some element of that that's happening. So sort of like these just like truly different ways of approaching the world that are trying to inhabit the same amount of space. Well, it's like, you know, I think you said it actually really good. It's like, these are the walls of freedom, but, and we're told that these are the walls of freedom, but no one feels that these are the walls of freedom. <laughs> like, everyone's just like, these are not the walls. These can't be the walls of freedom. Like, um, but we're like, these are the walls. Everyone's like, ever since you're a kid, you know, like, these are the walls of freedom. Like, America's the, the wall of freedom. <laughs> but then you grow up and you realize that at least these, these, this, like, you just, like, you're like, this, this is like, you know, and it becomes this really absurd thing that you have to then deal with where you're like, no way, like, this can't, these can't be the walls of freedom. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God, they totally forgot the part where they, they didn't mention it sucks here. Yeah. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to gloss over in second grade social studies. Like, I would have put that way earlier you know <laughs> yeah you know like uh, i don't know you know now you you really feel that these are not the walls of freedom let me uh just because because it, it is a question about or a television show about that happens very late at night and is also about dreams and about time i'm wondering can you maybe we'll we'll fade out on this one can you talk to us a little bit about the different times of day and how that kind of impacts your your thinking and your your making do you feel like the the drawings you make first thing in the morning versus the things that happen late at night what are the sort of like the the habits of of intuition and time yeah right now i have no um i used to be really good at having a kind of i guess structure or a structure for my practice but right now I'm like, I'm in a, I'm kind of living in a kind of, I mean, yeah, quarantine, right? Like this moment, it's so daydreamy and it's so like, uh, it's so, this is a word I learned in grad school, anachronistic. <laughs> it's so like, in it, like just out, like just time is so off that like, I mean, there's a through line, but it's like, um that through line is just trying to really at this point retain play it's like what can i do that will allow me to kind of be playful um 
and the drawings of the paintings of the writing of the reading or the walking for me it's all a practice to retain a kind of not just playfulness but just to retain a, a kind of to retain play in itself um and that for me is um play then just becomes a way for me to work out ideas um and i am just really interested in play as that act of working out ideas um yeah that's interesting do you think that um like w when you're trying to maybe make that's not a resolution but a an orientation towards play when when you find yourself in those situations of being like this is the this is the thing this is the thing is it often because that's like a tendency that you're experiencing that you want to sort of like embrace and go deeper in or is it in opposition to what seems to be like filling your mind when you aren't thinking about it like is that a is that a reaction to the world asking things to not be playful to mm. a post-grad school hangover to the waning days of the american Empire, yeah uh, the grad school hangover whatever. no i think it's oh I think it's honestly probably both of those things yeah where it's like there is something i think when i'm embracing something it is not separate from my resistance of something that i think those two things i think that does that answer like i think those two things align mm -hmm. so i think if i'm embracing play i'm resisting uh well, I guess the opposite of like the opposite of play would be labor or work. That play is like kind of more aligned to kind of like um, leisurely ideas, and work and labor is the opposite of leisure. Um, but I, I, what I'm okay. So I will say this: I'm resisting the labor of what I'm trying to <laughs> what I'm trying to resist, if it's anything, is the labor of identity politics. Um, I would say that. And so I think by being playful, I think as it aligns to the, the, the work or the portraits, for sure, that like when I paint a white person, I'm not, in a sense, asking this figure to perform whiteness. So no way am I going to ask this Black person that I'm depicting to perform Blackness. And so I think for, for them to be playful, they um, they outrun a, a, a representation or they outrun a kind of like expectation in, in play because it is improvisational and it usually um, is seeking something new. So I think in the playfulness of the paintings, you know, they kind of resist what is expected and not asking these representations of these people to perform a kind of specific identity, rather to sort of like, um, yeah, thinking more probably, it's probably more about language. Well, and also you were talking earlier about, and, and this is a, an obvious thing, people who look at your work of that sort of the playfulness of color and how that can kind of like subvert those because we wonder which parts, if the, if, if the person's ear is orange, then why do we think that that is like this flourish, but this other thing is like the, the kind of like identity component of it. There's a, there's a way that the color itself can be sort of like uh, shifted. And well, it makes me think yeah. also like maybe relating to dreams also, I think it's, I think it's really interesting about that is that maybe one of the things that we hear when people talk about dreams and they're like, Oh, I was in this house, but it wasn't my house. It was this house, whatever. Blah, 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 is that the sometimes the ways that things are different are described are like people want to ascribe to them that that's where that there's like the meaning inside of there that that's the additional layer of the symbol. But maybe the thing you're describing, which is that in its changing, it's actually about um, it's kind of like an evasion of that. That it's like a a denial of that thing that by changing it a little bit, then it's not supposed to be that symbol in the same way. Yeah, well, the, what I realized is that the color withholds. The color kind of sort of like withholds information in a sense. And so I think 
in any sort of uh, interpersonal relationship or social dynamic, there is also a yielding of oneself in relationship to another that must occur for a relationship to take place. And so I think by withholding that information, it kind of gives more space for the viewer to project themselves because not so much information is given that there is space that is open, essentially. Um, so by withholding information in the paintings, it sort of creates space for the viewer to enter. Mm. Because otherwise, it would just, if it, all the information was there, you, the painting would just give you would keep you out of it, you know? And I think by having these open spaces, you know, which um, becomes places for projection. That's beautiful. Let's, uh, let's leave it at that. All right. Um, I'm gonna go to sleep. Yeah. Thanks for being on the show. No, thanks for having me. This was great. I, I feel like I didn't do this yet, but this will now be the first time that we'll use the new uh, catchphrase for the end of the show, which is just sleep tight. Ah, oh, thank you. Don't let the bed bugs bite. <laughs> no, I don't think I don't think they have those out here. My mom has bed bugs right now. Oh man, yeah, this is a rough time for everything. It's like the, <laughs> yeah, the rough time to have bed bugs. <laughs> but like the whole world is just like there's this thick lens of like fuckness that is COVID and then being like, oh no, but all the other stuff still happens. <laughs> like, people are still, like having their hearts broken and stubbing their toes and like these Michigas militias and all this thing and being like, oh, but also like if you go outside without a mask, like you just die. And like, you can't see your friends. But that's no, like- <laughs> I, just had a, um, I had to go to the dentist today because I had a crown that broke. Yeah, and just like, yeah, I-, I, I <laughs> My mouth when I was biting into like a like a tootsie roll. <laughs> oh man! So I guess the the second way we'll end this is just to remind people to not fuck with taffies right now. Yeah. <laughs> just like don't go skiing, don't do taffies. There's no time for park walk. Go for like a a slow walk somewhere safe. <laughs> with the mask on. With a, a helmet. Wear a helmet. Like, you know. Feet from others. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good night. Love you. All right. All right. Love you too. I'll probably text you in a second. <laughs> Don't tell them oh. the, how they okay, <laughs>
I had braids and then a big ponytail and then she did and I could barely tell us apart in the footage and it looked like old Super 8 footage of my family but um, it was in this movie but I couldn't find the boy and then when I finally rewound it all the way to the beginning again it was like the start of a new movie and seemed sort of familiar but not quite and had older boys in it um, but then my sister was gone anyway I don't know where she went um, there was something about cats like my cat was there but then there was another cat and I would play with them a lot on the floor but they kept trying to get out and there was one point where my cat was very a lot smaller tried to get out um, when the mailman was coming in to talk to us and he was trying to tell us about this conspiracy and figure it out with us and I felt like I kind of knew a few things and some of it had to do with going to the roof to get the information about where these people met and there were these like sort of mailboxes, little ones, that when you, you could pull it off the wall and when you turned it around, you could kind of see secret messages behind them so that whoever knew how to open it, they could see the secret messages and know what to put there. And like, it said things like drugs and bad stuff that you might give from one person to another um, that you could put in these little slots. And so we were figuring this out, but we still didn't really know who it was. But I think I thought I knew because someone had done something weird earlier. Someone had tried to break in. Like the, the room was like a door into the living room, but then these three big glass panels that you could see out into the hallway. More like a school than a normal apartment, in a, an apartment building. And someone tried to break in through the glass to get something. But then I was, I just kept, I was more worried about the cats getting out, or at least that was my cover. Um, but I felt like he, that was the guy that we were looking for, that I couldn't really help the mailman. There were so many people there, family and old friends, in this tiny little apartment with big plush couches. And I felt like I really wanted to be a part of this and be helpful. Um, while also being sort of confused and hurried in the middle of it all. Um, at some point we had left the apartment and my boyfriend and I were walking down the main street and her apartment was just like around the corner from my place, like a five minute walk. But somehow I lost him on the way because I couldn't remember where it was and he had made a turn to cross the street and I wasn't looking and he just sort of disappeared. And then I kept going and this limo or something pulls up and out come all these people and I'm sure that it's the lead singer of the Moody Blues and his wife like circa 1969 or something and I'm excited because I really like them and I'm ready to kind of walk up and say something and then when I turn to him again it's that's not who it is he's more like some sort of young he's either like a young prince um, or like a Siegfried, like a circus guy or magic guy or something. I mean, the blonde wavy hair is a part of it. So I don't say anything, but he, they're behind me on the street and I can hear his accent. I just don't even understand what that accent is. He was very casual about it and I was feeling uneasy about it all, not really knowing where I was going. Um, oh, and then somehow related to this, my mom had to go feed some cats for this woman, cats that I knew that maybe I'd been in her apartment before painting or with my mom, maybe I still worked with my mom or, or we'd been there before and maybe it was in the same building, but you have to go in through the fire escape in the back and there's like a door on the fire escape and the cats kind of hang out like in and out of the window and on the fire escape and they were mean, like they were, gnarly sort of weird dark thick human teeth almost and small and scraggly and just long gross claws like trolls they'd come in and out of the window and you'd have to just be on this little platform to help them and, and I was there like immediately as soon as she started talking about it and I'm trying to like 
help them or cuddle them or something and they're just horrendous cats. But there's something about this conspiracy. I know that someone's trying to like let them out or something. But so then I have to leave because they're like totally attacking me. But I still know that my mom has to go back and feed them. But I don't know, maybe she kind of knows how to do that. This apartment building was very key in the way this was all sort of set up. It was totally architecturally dependent. And, and characters too. The mailman, the cats. I don't think prom night's ever gonna end. Our brains are gonna stay this way forever. Did you know that even when you don't remember your dreams, your brain is still dreaming, you're just not remembering them? Our next guest on the late, 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 late show is Carissa Mitchell. Carissa is an artist working across a lot of different fields. A lot of the work includes text. And a lot of it has to do a little bit, we're told, with dreams. Please welcome Carissa Mitchell. Hello. Hi. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. I'm I'm in my uh, my guest bedroom. Good. Yeah, your couch looks comfy. It is. It is comfortable. Do you yeah. uh, do you find you have different dreams if you're in your guest bedroom or your main bedroom? I don't really. I don't know. I don't sleep in my guest bedroom enough to know that. But I should try it and see. Like it could be like a rhythm thing, like a, a recorded like 
sleep so many nights in here and so many nights in my regular bed and like kind of gauge what happens. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good plan. <laughs> so tell me, tell us, sorry, a little bit about um, what kind of dreams you've been having recently. Oh, recently. Oh my gosh. Well, I have an upcoming show. So um, I think like a few weeks ago, I had one of those anxiety dreams like one that you would think like you end up naked in front of your entire class but instead I was just like having a show like I did grad school in Switzerland and so my show and my dream was in Switzerland and I was like just talking to the woman that ran the gallery and I was like well you know I know the show's in like three hours but I have to go by my studio to pick up the work to hang it and it was just like this bizarre like I woke up being like oh clearly I I'm having some anxiety here. But you were you were calm in the dream about this, uh, let's say, tardiness? I w yeah, I was just having this dream about like, yeah, here we go. I have a show in three hours and I haven't hung anything. Do you, do you often have um, dreams that relate to upcoming shows or that are take place inside of the studio? No, no, not at all. I think, but I, t I take like, no, no to either of the things, but I remember when I was, um, this was like three years ago now, three and a half years ago, I was writing my thesis and I would have these dreams where I would like, like letters would be draped around my apartment mm. and I'd have to go like pick them up, like actual letters. Like it was just like when I was writing. And so I write a lot in my practice, but I find these, um, like I have stress dreams that are just like, provoking to what I'm working on are like an abstract of what I'm working on and they become like really um action oriented like I sleepwalk and I sleep talk so like if I'm really stressed out like I'll just like perform it in my in my sleeping life hmm. what what sort of material were the letters I mean obviously it's dream whatever but did they have a sort of like a haptic feeling or did they drape in a certain way that revealed something about their materiality Oh, at the time I was living in the studio loft and I had this stairwell that went up to like the, the loft area. And yeah, the letters were like these black kind of fabric drapes that like hung over this, this stairwell. And I had to go pick them up individually. Hmm. And did they spell something specific? Were you that no. just sort of decoding and reorganizing them like a jumble? Yeah, I was just picking them up. I was just picking up letters. Interesting. Yeah. So when you when you sleepwalk, does that often correspond to what's happening in your dream or ordinary space, or is it uh, sort of unrelated activities? Um, this this is really creepy, which I, I don't think has anything related to my art practice, by the way. But like, I'll have dreams where I'm hosting guests, and usually I have these dreams when I'm like home alone. Mm. Like I I live with my partner, and so like if he'll be traveling, like and I'm home. I'll just have these dreams where like I'm supposed to be hosting somebody and so I get up in the middle of the night and I'm like oh my god I didn't I didn't prep for them like or I didn't let them in the door even like it's like they're waiting outside funny so um, have you prepared hors d'oeuvres or rearranged furniture or something well no, no, not, not at all but I have woken myself up like opening the front door to my apartment like to my the, to the stairwell in my apartment like I never actually leave my apartment so I've never like freaked myself out enough that like I feel um like I'm gonna do something dangerous in my sleep but I'll like get up and I'll open the door interesting yeah that's about it <laughs> search for letters open doors yeah, so it's, it's a very physical approach to that sort of dream space, but they're all still taking place inside of the, like, the shared domestic space. Yes, very much so. <laughs> when I say shared in that moment, I guess I'm referring <laughs> to your uh, waking and sleeping life, which is an interesting kind of conception of sharing. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I was, like, kind of prepping myself for, like, what does that mean between, like, waking and sleeping dreams? Like how do they inner exchange themselves? They're like, where do you find yourself in both places? And and can they um, occupy similar spaces? Yeah. Yeah, have you, you ever had, oh, go ahead, go, go, go. Well, do you spend a lot of time also then in the sort of like analysis mode with dreams or is it is it something that 
just happens or these, uh, I mean, is that also maybe a part of your dream to waking continuum? Uh, do you ever have the, I was, I was about to ask before you ask your question, which sure. kind of goes into your question. Do you ever have the dreams where like you wake up and you have the continuous feeling of the dream? Like it feels very real and then it like affects yeah. your, your day in some sort? Sure, absolutely. Including, you know, having had experiences of dreaming uh, involving some other person and then waking up and feeling very much like annoyed with them or betrayed yeah. <laughs> by them or that they should know a thing that they don't because it was something that only took place in my own subconscious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I had... Happens. We go... I, we, we, um, yeah, I had one of those dreams like a month ago. And it was really strange. It took like, it took till like 4 p.m. to like shake it off. Yeah, and because it is a sort of like feelingful thing, it's also maybe, I mean, even more so than other kinds of things where you have to remind yourself that it isn't real it somehow is like, no, but I, I did experience it. It feel, it felt, it felt kind of, I know it's, it felt real though, you know? Yeah, yeah, very much. Um, so how do you, uh, t talk to us a little bit about how dreams inform your practice or how they are integrated or, or not? Yeah, um, yeah, I was thinking about that since we, we text messaged each other where I was like, okay, how does this actually kind of go back and forth? But I think maybe, um, continuing that idea of like feeling of like a surplus that kind of that energy that that moves from this like waking or sleeping to waking space like I think about that energy sometimes in art making of like how do you kind of maybe leave something that lingers behind inside of an object our performance especially with voice our um in writing material but yeah I guess like I, I think about that and then like I also just have dreams and I'll, I'll wake up and I'll text my friends right away especially if they're in my dreams mm -hmm. and I try to like give as much detail as possible and I always find those really interesting recordings to have for myself because like sometimes I'll remember a lot and then if I don't write it down like I'll just eventually forget it so it's nice like to come back and have this like archive of dreams um and then I was thinking a lot like about the idea of like dreams coming true and then like my small obsession with ideas of like Disneyland hmm. um which really just comes out of like this idea of like a fantasy that people kind of like impose onto a place mm -hmm. but it's also very much like um a tangible thing because it's it's built around us in waking life but then kind of pulled from these ideas of the unrealistic side of our, of our fantasies and desires, which kind of go back into dream space. Yeah, that's also interesting. I mean, it's just funny to think about Disneyland, which is, I guess, a pretty, I don't know, fundamentally normalized part of our experience, just something that whether or not we've been there, but that also part of like the premise of it is that it's all things that are coming from movies that have, I mean, especially in the kind of different era, there was like, one hour and a half long thing that when this happened right it wasn't like these sort of like serialized television things or something like that or maybe before like there was a ton of merchandise and then you can go visit the place and so it's about kind of like wanting to enter into this sort of like discrete space of the cinema functions as a kind of like dream space dream surrogate entering into and then being able to like meet donald duck and he's actually six feet tall and his head is this big and he was just there and then you can go on a ride where you're like experiencing the narrative in a different way yeah it's a funny way to think about uh if there was some version of that maybe it would take place as like a vr thing but where you could sort of continue to exist inside of that dream space and now have it be these objects and people and places or something that can be explored in a different in a different register in a different way yeah, I haven't thought about it that way. I feel like maybe sometimes I think about it more on like the stance of, um, I'm I know I'm trying to like f formulate this, like the, the more realistic part of like how people find it this, this strange place to escape in waking life. Like, mm -hmm. um, but I, I like your input of it as well. Like I, I got really kind of intrigued about three years ago one i have never been to disneyland let me just put it that way i don't know if you have i haven't so it's funny that i spoke about it with such surety 
I wasn't busy when okay. I was in school, so I think yeah. I, maybe I get a little bit, but. Yeah, no, I also have never been, but I guess I got really interested in this idea that I met people that were like my own age that had um, passes, like season passes to go. And I thought that was like a very strange way to like experience your time or to want to be there. But I guess like in my mind, it's not the physical aspect of being there. It's more like the fantasy aspect of being there. Mm -hmm. I just like then when I started looking into it, like how obsessed people are to the point then um, I think I read somewhere where like somebody spread their their relatives ashes in Disneyland mm -hmm. and then got kicked out, you know, like, um, but I think these, I don't, I think they go back into like this dream space of like fluidity of, of what, do, what does it mean to go there and like project onto or go like have this sentiment to this like fantasy almost. Mm -hmm. And I think like you can get there in your, in your sleep, in your REM cycle, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting also just in terms of, I don't know, thinking about Disneyland as some version of a, uh, you know, like pseudo interactive space, like a museum or something like that, that then it feels like it's very, free or it's like open to you and your interests and then as soon as you transgress their boundaries you're immediately kicked out like yeah. being, you, you can be free here and do what you want and it's like the ashes come out it's like get out this is not yeah. this is what we do here like are you allowed to have um like a lucid lucid space and in, inside of this confinement because i i also thinking about dreams do you ever have lucid dreams where you can control them uh, I have in the past, but it's not something I worked that hard on. Okay. It is a theme of the talk show, so it's good that you're bringing it up. Yeah. Okay. What about you? Uh, yeah, I, I have, I was just talking to somebody about this weird, I don't know what they were saying that they control in their dreams, but I was saying, we were talking about repetitive dreams and I was saying like, okay, I have these dreams where I'm on elevators and they never take me to the place I want to go. And so I have learned throughout my dreams over the past 10 years that I can just stop myself in my dream and be like, no, this is a dream. It's fine. Hmm. Like the elevator is not working, like are not taking to me to where I want to go. Sometimes they just like free fall and it's just like, oh, it's going to be fine. Interesting. Yeah. And, and it's a confined space and but it's also like a, I mean, it's a room that moves, but one that we yes. don't necessarily fully feel unless it's not working um in those streams where the elevator is not taking where you want to go is it a thing where you're like pressing the button and it's not engaging or you can't remember where you're supposed to go or or like press the button and it takes me somewhere else or it just falls <laughs> when i'm going somewhere mm. um yeah there's no sometimes there's like there's no control in it which is also maybe what we want to apply to some type of certain art practice and then like we get stuck in these other directions that we're not meaning to go we have to just like figure it out mm -hmm. yeah if we if we bring it back to that but yeah I, I don't know like I just find I find find dream um the dreamscape like realistic and then not like the the interpretation of self inside of there are your experiences um really applies sometimes to even viewing art not just making it like you're bringing yourself there and mm -hmm. your own experience and your own input and your own like bias even when viewing something and i wonder like how does that how does that affect like how we're interpreting dreams or even like interpreting the work that we're we're viewing or maybe how we input ourselves into work that we're making Mm -hmm. yeah do you ever um are your dreams always from a sort of like first person perspective in which you are most certainly the first person I think so I think it it, it changes every once in a while but mostly I'm myself and you do you do you know that about yourself do you dream from another perspective um less from a different subject perspective than maybe from like almost if to kind of like continue a sort of like cinema metaphor something where i can sometimes see myself in the space and so it's more like i'm um a character there okay uh but that becomes complicated in terms of like 
it's, it's not it's not strictly observational because it still feels like you're sort of you meaning me uh, am subjectively inside of that other being in terms of knowing what's happening and that sort of feeling of not omniscience but shins is coming from that character but being able to mm -hmm. see them uh, more like the main character in the movie or a character in the movie even if we sort of like know them to be the primary thing which is you know most movies are very few of them are shot kind of from a first person perspective even if we can intuit the sort of uh the subjectivity we're supposed to be inhabiting yeah did you do a lot of filmmaking uh yeah <laughs> I, I do and i also and i teach in that and that's what it says but but not things that have people in them usually or that are shot that way or something like that so it's not okay. doesn't really relate to the work in the, in, the, in that sense yeah. except that I, like I'm, I'm thinking about these things but it's not um yeah but yeah no, there is definitely uh probably not an unrelation in there <laughs> okay what's your relationship with elevators outside of the dream space um, I don't know. I think when I moved to Chicago, I started having a fear of heights, which is a really strange thing. Yeah. Like very minor at first too, just being like on, on floors that I could look over you know, to the outside. Um, yeah, I don't remember having a, well, I mean, I never really think I liked airplanes, but I never remember having that much fear of them. And then like, yeah, I don't know if that started in Chicago but I think it did maybe it's all the sky it's all the high rises around here yeah it's also something where I feel like uh Chicago has just like this very I don't know interesting relationship with like <clears throat> verticality and horizontality it's like the flattest the flattest oh, yeah. it just happens to also have these moments of peaks yeah. it's not like it's not I mean right now I'm, I'm staying in a place in the mountains and so there's a lot of topography but everything but all like the buildings are short um, and in Manhattan or something like that, it's like everything feels very vertical, but there's a way that Chicago has a sort of like strange in between that you can always see the skyline, but mostly like this much is considered a hill. There's like curbs that are hills. Oh know? yeah, it, it's, it's insane. <laughs> and that's, a lot, you know? that's interesting. Did your dreams um, change when you were living in, in Switzerland? Even specifically, how about here's a, here's a second question. Yeah. In terms of language. Oh, my French is really bad. So I didn't, I, I don't think I, every once in a while I would have like small dreams in French, maybe just me practicing French. But I, I so te <laughs> technically I lived in this border town off of Switzerland in France, um, this little town called Fernay Voltaire, where the philosopher Voltaire lived in the last part of his life after he got exiled out of Paris. Hmm. And because Geneva is like Geneva Switzerland is this Calvinist um city they wouldn't allow theater so he moved into this small little village outside and so this mm. little town has a lot of theater there but um yeah I would I would have these like really crazy dreams for like the first year that I lived there where I would just like constantly wake up trying to find my papers like such as like I would be in panic of, like where's my passport like Where's my marriage certificate? Like these things that felt really valuable that I needed all the time. Like I would just, yeah. Um, yeah, I have I have different dreams based on like maybe spaces I live in, like the aura of them almost. Like I lived on the West Coast and I remember having very different dreams there. And then like, I feel pretty, um, like my apartment now is just quite calm. So I don't, have as many wild dreams. Interesting. Yeah. And also then thinking maybe more about language and dreams more generally, I um, mean, you talked about the picking up the letters and maybe sometimes it's in French. Um, I'm guess I'm just sort of curious, can you, yeah, just talk a little bit about the sort of like the, the interactions between language and, and dreams. Language and dreams. Huh. I feel like they're very visual spaces for me instead of maybe linguistic. Um, I think there's a lot of visual happening. There's a lot of like sensory happening in my dreams more than they're just vivid. Um, and I don't 
now that we're like talking about it, I'm like, do we, do I talk in my dreams? Like I know I do, but it's also very, um, other cues besides verbal. Sometimes they're like expressions of body language. Like I had, I, I've had a lot of dreams about friends that are in Europe. And like one of them was I was in this car ride with like all these Swiss people and one just turned around and winked at me. And that was it. That was the dream. <laughs> like there was no, there was like no real interaction of, of verbal cues. That's interesting. Were, were you reading the, uh, when you were talking earlier about the needing your, your papers in that moment, I was struck also that in that moment, we were with those, that sounds very much kind of like, you know, in some ways like a sort of classic anxiety dream of the, somebody needs your papers kind of thing, but also it's very striking. And I hadn't, I don't know that I thought about this before because there's so many like where your papers, things and literature and whatever, but about how those also signify this kind of like the interaction of the state and then some version of identity, right? That it's like yeah. the passport is a way of saying like, no, I exist. And then the marriage service way of being like, and I exist in relation to other people. But they're this way that it is like the, the state sanctioned version of like who you are. Were you reading yeah. in terms of that kind of anxiety relating to the state or as a kind of like that the, the passport signified who you were or maybe some relationship between them or? I don't know if I thought about it so much, but I think I, I see where you're going with it. Um, I think it is a form of identification that it's also kind of a strange one. And I think, I don't know if you, I don't know if you're talking to other people that are like, in between these international spaces, this form of identity that happens, like where you just, once you kind of leave your place of birth, like your that identity becomes so prevalent. Like it's just, mm -hmm. that's what it, you're that. And you're like this own, um, you're like an ambassador to your culture in this way that you never thought you would be. So yeah, I it is like this symbol of, of either like who you are or where you are. Um, huh. Yeah, I mean, I think about, I haven't thought about this with the dreams, but it is something I think about often in terms of like, you know, somebody moves somewhere and then all of a sudden their nickname is like Kansas and being like, <laughs> just that now I have to like defend and talk about this place and I have to always be referring to it or explaining it when often the reason that person left is because they didn't particularly want to be there. <laughs> Yeah. Not to be forever, but that there is something like the one thing a person in Switzerland knows about this American is that they are not in America. And there's probably a reason <laughs> for that that it's not just like that they're so they need a knife or they need chocolate or something like that, right? Like there is, um, yes, it's a very curious thing that then all of a sudden you become like really closely identified with that thing. Yeah. Maybe start yeah. to into, I don't know, wearing the Philadelphia Eagles hat, even though like in Philly, you were like, I hate sports. And I, and the kids who like, <laughs> want to be a sport. I don't know. No. That's, that's very, you, you like run into some random person that's wearing like a Packers sweater. And they're just like, I found this at a thrift store. It's like, um, I'm a Packer. <laughs> this is really good for me. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, I don't. Um, I feel like that could go on another tangent, like the idea of American identity are these like symbol symbols of uh, American identity, especially from place. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange one. How uh, do you have dreams now that take place in, in France and Switzerland? No, I think my friends are just here in the U.S. Like the, the people that I know that are in like Europe and France and Switzerland are just like in the U.S. with me, which is just funny. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've never spent time with them here. It's not like we've engaged each other in the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, are that actually... A Go no, I, I was going to say I had a dream where I was in France, but on like the L train. Hmm. And like a friend from Switzerland was there. They call it Le L there, I think. Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the L. Drum. Yeah. Are there uh, are there rituals that you, in a very wide sense, that you do in terms of trying to uh, produce a certain kind of dream, or have you sort of uh, 
experimented with of how to affect your dreams in the waking life? I have not. Have you? Uh, no, not really. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think like there have been times when I've like, you know, um, basically like in falling asleep, like talked to myself into being like, this is what you should do. But that was, yeah. I, I think about that even more as being kind of like in high school being like, okay, you didn't do your homework. Here's what you're gonna do. Do it in your dream. Like you really just need to do it, like that kind of thing, which is not exactly the same thing. Um, Did it work? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I graduated. No, it didn't work. congratulations. It didn't work. I was never. Yeah, I graduated. <laughs> thank you. A lot of people don't know that about me. Like, we'll never talk about it, but it's kind of a thing. Um, no, but, but just that there have been other people that I've been talking to that have talked about sort of different, yeah, you know, like small rituals they've done, whether they're interested in lucid dreaming or. Um, I don't know, or just like as a kind of experiment to see like, can one induce certain things in that space? Or will our subconscious push back against that? Is it even that direct? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have rituals are spaces that I kind of prompt myself into dreams. I think I just am very, I have very vivid dreams and I'm also, I also realize I'm dreaming. I think that's kind of like the key point where I'm like, I can tell myself I'm dreaming. Like I have that ability to be like somewhat conscious in that state of unconsciousness where I'm like, hey, especially if the dream starts to get wild and I feel threatened, mm -hmm. I'm able to like wake myself up or be like, no, this is a dream. Which I kind of feel like this is this, this strange space of like sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't, but usually it's in these like high risk situations mm. where I'm able to kind of like calm myself down inside of the space. That's good. That feels like uh, an important use. If there is a release valve to use it for that as opposed to being like, this is so delicious. Like it's just a dream. It's not real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, use it to get out of there. Um, well, I think we have time for one more thing. What will you, do you have uh, another dream that you might want to tell us about, whether it's recent or in the past? Um, I'm trying to think. I feel like I'm going to stay away from scary dreams. I had a dream. Um, this must have also happened in the past month. I had a dream that I was with this friend and we like were driving. I've had a lot of car dreams lately, actually where I'm like driving with people. Um, maybe it's because I want to go somewhere <laughs> in real life. But um, this friend is also from Switzerland. And I remember waking up and texting her to telling her she was in my dream. But we just like, you know, were there and there were two other people. And one of them looked at me and they were talking about the arts. And they were just like, Carissa, some of us are having fun. And I feel like it was this dream to like prompt me to be like, you're allowed to like just have fun in this space. Like, what are you doing? Don't overthink it. And then the next thing we know, we're at a mall and we're getting lunch at the food court and I'm in the bathroom and all of a sudden there's like a bookshelf there and I'm just feeling this bag, duffel bag with all the books on the bookshelf, which are mine. I don't know why they were in the bathroom, but they wouldn't fit into my bag. Huh. so I don't know what happened to them I woke up eventually but I feel like the dream was just like this strange emotional terrain of like you should just be having fun yeah. <laughs> why are you reading all these books no I mean I, I love to read but sure. but also the idea of like just trying to pack them into a thing to go on this trip to have this fun trip and be like I can't fit all of them. I, can, I only be, have enough to read for 40 <laughs> continuous days on this week long trip. Yeah, no, it was like, it was a, a really large bookshelf. Yeah, yeah. And it, it was, a, and I haven't been to a mall in forever. In a mall food court? I don't even know when that was. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could say you've been there recently, just that it was maybe in a dream. <laughs> yeah, that too. It's a good response when people ask if you've been, been to Disneyland and be like, well, I mean, in dreams, but beyond that, no, I mean, physically, no. But I mean, yeah, I've, I've, I've been, yeah, sure. Well, dreams do come true. I heard that about, who said that? Was it uh, Duffel, Duffel Bag? Louis Duffel Bag or something like that? I don't know. <laughs> Walter Disney, Walter Disney, I think maybe. <laughs> Is he the one who came up with that slogan? Uh, I think that he mostly, instead of coming up with things, sort of like uh, poached them and rearranged them. 
but okay. that's, you know, I, I don't, I, who am I to cast aspersions on Volter Disneyman? Um, great. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us and being on the show. Yeah, thank you. And uh, sweet dreams. Welcome back to the late, 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 late show. My next guest is Mikey Ray, an artist, musician, thinker, schemer, feeler, dreamer. And he's joined us here in the Oneric Dog Park for conversation about his lives, dreaming and awake. Hi, Mikey. Hola. ¿Cómo estás? Bien, gracias. ¿Y usted? Estoy bien. Muy bien. So, could you tell us a bit about your sueños? What have you been dreaming about recently? Well, um, I hadn't remembered any of my dreams for a long time. I thought, thought that I hadn't dreamt in years, but um, I learned recently by way of um, um, my girlfriend uh, reading on the subject of lucid dreaming that, in fact, your brain does go into that dream state nightly, but you just may not remember it. So I've been trying to develop um, a habit of recall and I'm only getting bits and pieces, but I remember for instance that last night I dreamt um, one of a specific place where I have like maybe five or six like dream locations I'm aware of that are like bizarro alternate versions of places I know or have lived. One of which weirdly, for instance, is the um, Sam's Club in Santa Fe on Rodeo Drive, where like, you know, I've known since I was a kid and I've, for some reason, uh, that's been a reoccurring dream space. As has where I was yesterday, which was this kind of um, cemetery spackled green hillside um, with weird proportions in Portland, Oregon, where Noah and I, um, our old friend Noah DeVore, um, known as Keyboard, um, and I were playing some informal, like, art opening um, party or, like, house party of some sort. And, um, yeah, that's, uh, that was the general setting of my dream. Interesting. Do you have a sense of why the Sam's Club? No, I don't. Um, I'm symbolic of what I couldn't tell you, but it has been, like, a place of note insofar as the occasions going there were um, getting ready to go to camp uh, for like two weeks as a small kid. Um, so like preparing for um, supplies for your sojourn uh, without your parents in uh, yeah, the newfound freedoms of adolescence. Mm -hmm. I guess one thing I'm sort of curious about, so even though you were saying that you haven't really remembered your dreams in past times, <clears throat> um, it does feel like there's there's a sort of, a, I don't know, with, without sort of using cliches, there's a dreamlike quality to a lot of the work that you do in the way that it sort of mixes symbols and signs from childhood and, and one's past, but then also sort of like uh, confers upon them new meanings and there's like a sort of like six percent offness to some of the things mm -hmm. that I think actually does typify a lot of what people describe as being these kind of dreamlike spaces mm -hmm. and I'm wondering um, I mean is, is there sort of like a way is there a specific mode that you feel like you're tapping into in those moments um, does it feel just like quite naturally that's just what happens when when your hand is near the paper um, are there kind of like inducements for that? If you could just sort of, I don't know, I'm not sure what the question is there. Yeah, um, I guess I always feel a lot more than 6% off myself personally. So in that way, I guess you could say that it comes easily, but I think- um, Maybe I was using the metric. I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I couldn't tell you that. But indeed, there are inducements one may do, and I found in my time doodling and drawing um, that there are certain things you can do with your hand, namely doodle um, and draw, that can provide a position of leakage, almost like a peanut butter jar or something um, uh, that eventually gets the peanut butter of your subconscious mind and um, kind of deeper emotional state. Um, activated and able to leak out through your hand, through that process. Um, 
one warm-up exercise for just such a thing that I think is really good and that is taught by the beloved MacArthur Fellow, Linda Berry, um, is to begin just by drawing spirals and you try to intentionally slow down your hand and try not to cross lines and just spiral until you're done. Um, as you listen to either a passage of some text read aloud or some music, um, but that for a couple of minutes can really put your brain in a entirely different kind of creative, intuitive, interior space. What do you listen to in your drawing? Um, it depends. I like audio books. Um, I've listened to um, Moby Dick and Blood Meridian and the complete Edgar Allan Poe more than a few times. Um, but I also like podcasts about um, mysteries and um, unusual episodes from history. And um, I like television when I have access to it, but I can't always watch TV. How come? I guess I could if I really wanted to, you know, but I guess I don't want to do it all the time. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind someone buying me a TV. <laughs> Maybe this will be sort of like uh, an inverse ad. Yeah, I mean, if you have one, that'd be great. Yeah, can you speak a little bit to wanting a TV and where, I mean, what are the sort of mechanics of somebody getting you a TV if they are watching and want to sort of yeah. increase that Well, part of your think practice? of it this way, it actually wouldn't need to be set up to internet or cable or anything um, because the objective would be to plug in my Super N Nintendo, which was um, recently returned to me after maybe five to ten years um, uh, doing time in Texas. Um, uh, my parents having uh, brought it along with um, some other miscellaneous items back and I want to play some Super Nintendo but I um, can't do that unless I plug it into a TV monitor. Um, I guess my phone number would be the easiest way to get a hold of me so if you want to give me a TV um, I'll come come and get it pretty much. Um, and we could discuss shipping if such a thing would need to be done and whether it would be worth it or not because depending on the you know the state of your monitor and whatnot it might make less sense to mail it from you know where i don't know some place where to mail such a thing would be more that of a hassle than um a convenience mm. um but i could accept gift cards too to, mm -hmm. to uh, the savers like, for instance yeah or usps or yeah usps for instance too I, that would be that's a great gift jesse good thinking thank you um, and my number is 505 Six nine nine seven two seven eight, and my name is Mikey Ray. Also, Mikey, we're 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 at the dog park. We're sort of in the arroyo of the dog park, but mm -hmm. um, one of the other in the kind of like I guess you could call it like the downtown do dog park. Uh -huh. There's the bulletin board, which I guess functions as sort of like the public square for the downtown dog park. Yeah. And I noticed that um, there was somebody who was you that had lost their phone. Yeah. Um, was that recovered here? It was, but I had, I was in a pinch um, and ended up um, buying a new phone before it was returned. But amazingly enough, it was returned. That's nice. Buy somebody here? Yes. That's great. The dog park is, it's a good community. I had come back um, maybe and circled my exact route and more maybe five times, including several at night, um, thinking that perhaps... Um, there would be a vantage point somewhere here that I could see down uh, for a good lengthy bit of terrain and that maybe perchance it would be face up and you'd be able to see its screen light up in the darkness. But one thing I didn't account for, especially in the dying twilight, was that how many, you know, thousands and thousands of shapes that could potentially be cell phone-like in like if you're scanning the ground here. You know, take your pick. They all look like cell phones to me. <sighs> Welcome back to the Lay of Lay. Lay of Lay, Lay of Lay. We're so excited to have back on the show. Artist, 
chef, entrepreneur, gadfly, and one of the great presences in Chicago, alternative, late night, ambient television. Please welcome back to the show for a special segment on Midnight Snacking, our very own chef, Stella J. Brown. Chef Stella J. Brown. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? This meeting is being recorded, it said. <laughs> yeah. Zoom doesn't know the talk shows and meetings. Do you want me horizontal? Whatever you want. There's, there's some vertical and some horizontal. Hmm. Horizontal's a little more, yeah, I mean, then we can see more of you. I'm not, are we, is this all recorded? Are we live? We're live. Let me get one more thing to make my thing higher. Okay. I mean, you know it's live because right now it's like Saturday at like five in the morning, right? Or maybe Sunday. It's kind of hard to tell what's Sunday Saturday. Well, I didn't know that, I didn't know if the, if the, the guests were already live also. You've been, you've been with me forever. Okay. Hi. You're so energetic for it being the middle of the night. You know, I couldn't sleep and I had some drinks. And so maybe I woke up because I couldn't sleep. And so here I'm just needing something to nibble on to get me sleepy again. Hmm. Is, do you ever find yourself needing bread? Needing bread? No, that's like a, that's an old bakery joke from the old days. Oh, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm addicted to the sugars that are in bread. Good. So um, thank you for coming back to the late, 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 late show. Obviously you're a fan favorite, so you don't need much of an introduction. Um, but what do you have going for us today with this midnight snack? Well, it's after the holidays. I thought people just have some leftovers. Maybe you haven't been shopping in a while. So I wanted to show you what I have in my fridge and then show you what I'm going to mix up for a little midnight snack or later than midnight snack, mm -hmm. post midnight snack. Mm -hmm. All right. That sounds great. Yeah. I mean, one of my great interests always is what to do with leftovers. It feels like the sort of, uh, I don't know, the great yeah. the kitchen. And maybe you want something a little healthier cause it's like the new year and maybe you're trying to be healthy. So maybe I'll show you what I have in my fridge. Great. And then Let's see. Okay. Oh, by the way, I moved and this is my new fancy fridge. Nice. Is that, can you get ice out of the door? Not yet. <laughs> it's not hooked up. One can imagine okay. that. Okay. Like any, like any person, I've just gotten a Costco membership. So I have 24 eggs <laughs> and too many avocados. Mm. An embarrassment of avocados. Maybe it's a little too late or early for a beer. Let's see. I started buying pre-peeled garlic and it's the most luxurious thing I know about. I have some salad dressing. Okay. Let's see. I have some prosciutto. Ah, prosciutto. My goodness. That could be good. This is just a broth. I don't really want a soup in the middle of the night. The chicken, maybe I'll eat it tomorrow. I've got, I love a good bean sprout, but that doesn't feel like a midnight snack. Hmm. Nothing with too much water content, right? Cause then you might wake up having to urinate again. Interesting. So like a nice sort of uh, cracker on cracker sandwich or something like that maybe. Yeah, and I don't want to cook my Chinese broccoli. But well, you know what I do have is all of these cheeses and meats. Look at this. This is a gift from a from a parent's neighbor passed on to us. 
There's three of them. Yeah. It's and just... then I have some, some cheeses shared with uh, my mother from my Wisconsin residing uncle. So maybe I'll grab some of these cheesy meaty things. Maybe some olives, maybe this leftover apple. Okay. okay. I think I see where this is going. Yeah, maybe a little like charcuterie board, but maybe something not too ridiculous because it's the middle of the night. Do you have any questions you want to ask me while I'm preparing this? It might take a minute. Um, well, I guess I'm wondering, do you have any sort of uh, midnight snack um, inspirations from media? Dagwood or the Rarebit Fiend or are there other sort of, uh, I don't know, recollections you have from, from that space? Cinematic midnight snack heroes? Oh, I just started watching that uh, Japanese show, The Midnight Diner. Oh, I don't know about that. Is it about? It's a, it's a, it's a Japanese show and it's based, it's live action, but it's based on a, um, on manga, hmm. which I think is really funny to go from manga to, from animated to live action. I guess they're doing that with the Disney movies, but it's called Midnight Diner. And it's like, I don't know when they made it, but it's shot on that weird, like British speed film where everything looks a little too realistic. Uh-huh. Huh. huh. And do they do they sort of flip are, the, the form so it feels sort of anime, like the the angles and the editing and things like that, or is it just the aesthetic? Maybe just maybe just in the oops, <laughs> maybe just in the that it's like episodic in a way that feels like here's a little story, here's a little story. But they're always eating. They do they do this thing. I should have I should have made this for myself to show all of you. They take little hot dog wieners and they cut, pretend my finger is the hot dog, and they cut it in an X. So the end is like a little cross cut, and then you fry them, and then the four little feet go like this, and then it looks like a little octopus. Hmm, yeah. Should have made that. I've seen sort of versions that sometimes it also have like spaghetti stuck through it so that it gives it an, an additional. <laughs> Well, when we do the when we do the late, 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 late episode for Halloween, I can make that. Oh, that'd be fun. That's, yeah. that's, that's <laughs> the, the nightmare special, right? The nightmare special. <laughs> and specifically, like what kind of foods you can eat to induce nightmares. Yeah. Um, why your nightmares are real. Like just, you know, like a kind of feel good, fun thing. A sort of COVID. Does, does food give you nightmares? I feel like uh, people talk about that, that, not me, or maybe me, I don't know, but I feel like people talk about how with certain kinds of foods, um, it'll arouse sort of like more more negative feelings in their dreams or more intensity. I don't think that happens to me. I can't think of anything. I dream sometimes, but not all the time. How often do your dreams take place in the kitchen or involve sort of cooking or parts of your practice? You know what's funny? Not very often. <laughs> I think, oh no, but they, what I was thinking about this. I have, I, I don't always remember my dreams that vividly, but I have a couple recurring dreams. One of which, and it's like things that I used to do frequently and I've spent a lot of time doing and they're always stress dreams. So one of them is in a swimming pool because I used to be on the swim team. <laughs> so it's always at a, my high school swimming pool. Another one that I've been having is Wait, what, I mean, what happens there? What happens at the pool? It's just things. I'm late for things. People are there. Those I can't remember so much. And then another one I've been having is like, I'm in school, but I've like enrolled in this new program. And I, it's like a high school where you go every single day to these classes. And the one class I keep forgetting about and missing is the, um, is the math class, which is like the class where at the end of the semester, if you haven't been going to the class and keeping up with the homework, you're going to fail because it's math. So that one's stressing me out. But then the food related one is I still have restaurant waitress dreams constantly hmm. where you're like, I have too many tables and you're trying to get, you know, it's like where you're running and you're, you're not going anywhere, but it's like, you trying to wait tables in slow motion. Like you're trying, like the martini is sitting on the 
bar and you keep trying and trying and trying and people are asking for their martini. So that's my, all my dreams are stress related apparently. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, do the do the server dreams take place at restaurants you worked at or just sort of a general space or? I would say both. Sometimes it's, the last restaurant I worked at was Balsam in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in downtown Chicago. And I had to wear a, a pink shirt and like a gray suit vest and a purple tie. <laughs> so sometimes it's there and sometimes it's generic generic restaurant that um no space restaurant yeah but, but never at, at the swimming pool never restaurant at the swimming pool <laughs> you haven't had any any sort of hybrid dreams where you're trying to serve but you're also trying to swim but you're in math class no i don't think so <laughs> well i'm almost done with my snack do you want to see it or sh or do we do we have some more topics to cover well i mean i want to I mean, what I want to do is to taste it, but I guess given the limitations, I could give you a, I could give you a tour of what I've made and describe the flavors. That sounds perfect. That sounds, you okay. know, that, that sounds perfect. Okay, so let me just get what I made and remember. This is just this isn't too fancy. I don't want you to get any like big ideas because. This is just things I had in my fridge, you know? So this is just like a simple oh cheese and meat board. It's not a big, it's not a big snack. It's just like a little something to tide me over till breakfast. Hmm. Looks so, so beautiful. Yeah, tell us a little bit, walk us through this, uh, this improvised little. So this is a good thing to make when you have, for me, lots of meat and cheese holiday leftovers. So this is like a nice sharp cheddar. And this came from Whole Foods from Caitlin Arnold. This is like a white, oh no, this is a Gouda. Mm -hmm. And this is a nice sharp cheddar. Um, this is your Braunschweiger. This is your um, Wisconsin classic. It's a liver sausage. And then I've put out my little horseradish mustard. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of our nice holiday cheese logs this one is i believe pecans and this is like your this is like your spreadable pub cheese kind of thing mm. these i just whipped these up these are handmade it's an everything cracker because i didn't have any crackers in the house oh goodness and then so this guy i wish you could smell this guy not only is this like a stinky almost like Lindberger cheese i've had it in my fridge for at least two months. <laughs> Can you see the stink lines coming off of it? <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Then let's see my, that like apple I found, some almonds. And then of course, because I'm a uh, Costco member now, this is my prosciutto de Parma. Mm. And you know, I won't eat the greens, but they're just like, even in the middle of the night, you want your snack to seem bright and fun. Yeah. Oh my God, that looks so delicious. And this all came to an end. Oh, and those olives also? Oh yeah, a couple of those. Cause I've run out of the juice from the jar so they're no good for martinis anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So. What do you, what do you suggest people pair their sort of um, late night dream charcuterie with if they wanted something to sip on a sort of a, a, a light quaff mid, mid It depends, you know, it depends if you would like to have something to calm you down, in which case I might choose a nice warmed up almond milk, mm -hmm. one of my favorites, but maybe you're a nightcap person and you want to have a little brandy. I don't like brandy, maybe a little grappa, but that's more for digestion. I'm going with water today. A classic, if ever there was one, water. Yeah. <laughs> you do the almond milk. But too. anyway. Do you add any spices to the almond milk? Like a sort of horchata idea? Or, or what, what sort of things would you recommend pairing that with? I am joking. I don't, I don't drink warm almond milk. But, you know, during the um, quarantining, I did have too many almonds. 
they came from Acre. They were left over and I wanted to use all the al almonds before they went bad. So I made almond milk and then I spiced it like horchata and it was delicious. And it was basically just, you soak the almonds with rice and cinnamon and a little sugar overnight in water. Once you soak, you blend it and then you squeeze it through a dish towel and it's like delicious horchata. And that's the horchata that doesn't have the dairy because you may know I'm lactose intolerant, which is why I can only eat this much cheese like in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, incredible that our bodies have that sort of like allergy free hour in the middle of the night. And I, feel I know. Like you know about that because it's incredible to have that sort of luxury. I know. It's like the, uh, I don't know what I'd do without it. <laughs> but sorry that I didn't have that much to show you. And I'm a little embarrassed by the board. So maybe like next time I can plan ahead a little. Yeah. But if, of course, there is something that's so exciting about the uh, improvisational spirit. I mean, I don't know. I, do you have any sort of words of wisdom or advice for people who are you know, about to go into their own fridges and maybe discover that their olives don't have much juice left in them or like how does uh, just the very heel piece of the bread, how does that become something so beautiful like what you made? Yeah, I think especially right now, we should be thinking about using every piece of everything. So maybe even though you don't have you beautiful, perfect turkey sandwich, think about what you can do with some things left out. Like have your turkey on lettuce mm -hmm. <laughs> or have your olive without vodka, just an <laughs> olive. <sighs> or when you don't have bread, make your own crackers. Mm -hmm. It's just water and flour. And yeah, I and getting to, to keeping things around like cured things that don't go bad. Mm -hmm. Salted and cured things. Your sodium intake intake might go up, but you'll have less waste. That's my advice. And you'll, and you'll pee less if you're mostly just ingesting salt, right? Yeah. <laughs> In that case, have the high water content snack. Have the cucumber if you're going to pair it with prosciutto. <laughs> God, That's my advice. Was just how desperate we were in in our phase of austerity to think about having an olive without any vodka. It's just so, we'll look back on these days, you know, and we'll wonder how it happened. Well, Stella, Stella J. Brown, Chef Brown, thank you so much for letting us back into your kitchen. And thank you for having me. And we'll see you next time. And yeah. Sweet dreams from the late, 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 late show. I think after I eat a good amount of this cheese board, I'll I'll be sleepy enough to make it through the night. Uh huh. For your for your second or third nap, it's a shift. Yeah. Basically. Oh yes, I I use the seventeenth century style of sleeping, of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were right about most medical things, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good night. Sweet dreams. Our next guest on the late, 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 late show is Gina Ray Lacheva, Lacheva, Lacheva. A person I've known since I was, um, before I was born, before I was born. Uh, our parents knew each other in like a prenatal yoga class. And so we bumped bellies when we were inside the bellies before we were born. She has a new book out. She's a great writer and painter and so many things, but a new book out called Beasting Wild, which is worth picking up. And uh, let's talk to Gina. Gina. Are you there? Hello. Hello. Welcome to the late, 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 late show. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. So I know you've been on the virtual road. Um, your book release coincided with COVID, and so it's been a lot of 
being places without ever leaving your house. Um, but let's let's get right into the heart of the matter. Talk to us about your dreams. What are your dreams well, like? I uh, I started writing them down around September. And I found a few passages I thought I would read to you. Um, on the way, I discover you can hold up the dying wildflowers and breathe and think yellow, and they will turn green and bright again. So that was the part that I thought was very strange. <laughs> right, yeah. That shows so much more agency than I think often people have in their dreams. Yeah, I have lucid dreams a lot, which is fun. Do you want to talk about that or should we read the next passage and then talk about it? I feel like lucid dreams are an important thing to talk about. Let me read the next passage if I can find it and then we can talk about it. <clears throat> I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's long. I'll just read another sentence. Yeah. I was in a short jean dress that kept riding up to expose my bare butt. Then I contemplated buying smoked salmon. <laughs> so that's not a dream. That's just like what I was experiencing at Trader Joe's today. Yeah. So in terms of lucid dreams, have you um, kind of actively worked on that practice or is it something that comes naturally to you? Yeah, it seems like sometimes I can decide to do whatever I want in a dream, which is fun. And what are the kinds of things you want to do? Usually I want to have sex with whoever I'm having a dream about. <laughs> but uh, sometimes it's like flying. Sometimes it's just like playing with the reality of whatever. Cause it's, I often get like lucid once I'm already inside the dream. Mm -hmm. Not so it's not like Carlos Castaneda where you like look at your hands and then you figure out what you want to do or put yourself into a certain dream. Like I become lucid in the middle. I also have prophetic dreams. Go ahead. Um well, like there was a dream that I had in this dream journal about SM with a particular friend. And then like a month later, I was randomly texting with him and he revealed to me that he's really into S&M hmm. and I had no idea. So there's things like that, that sometimes will like pop up in dreams and then circle into reality. How do you feel? I mean, so that, that's about sort of like a kind of uh, future thinking or projective mode of, of, of dream making. Um, do you find yourself also encountering past selves? Or is it mostly things like a, like different ages? Yeah, or, or like or like different different. Um, you speak Cleopatra kind of thing. <laughs> well, maybe not that far, but that's interesting too. But like, I was thinking more about um, just something that had happened at some other time, and you being back inside of a a situation that you wish had gone differently, or you're sure that you're in like a you at a different moment. Well, two things. One, um, I often dream of like the same house that I go back to. So I'll go back to the same house. Um, it's a it's a magical, mystical dream house, but it it often shows up in dreams over and over again. Is it a house uh, you've, so that, you've been in, or is it a, a totally no? New? It's it's a totally new house, and sometimes it's in different configurations when I get there, but. It, I always know that it's the same house. Huh. Like I've been to this house before. What so it's not really past self, but it's like a dream location. Where Where is it? What does it look like? How does it conform? It's like rambling and it's on a river. There's lots of like layers, like levels to it. Okay. Um, and it's always on a river. And yep. then when I was a really little kid, I had this recurring dream that I realized at some point was a dream of my own death mm. or like a my own funeral or something like 
or perhaps it was a dream of my birth, but, and I was like a really little kid. I used to have this dream like two or three. Huh. Do you remember how your yeah. parents talked to you about that when you talked to them about it? No, I don't know if I ever told anyone about it actually. This might be the first time I've ever talked about it. <laughs> this is like a fresh release. Interesting. Um, so that house, do you feel like it, it uh, does it change based on sort of what you're desiring, experiencing in that moment? Probably. There's always like some adventure happening inside of it. What? Or like new rooms that I'm discovering. What changed in terms of your your practice as a writer, as a painter, or even just like as a, a, a civilian, as a person who's walking around the world, when you started to write down your dreams? You know, actually like nothing. And I think that's why I stopped was I was not finding, like I was really hoping to see some patterns in there. Um, and I was looking for a house to buy during this time period. So I was dreaming of a lot of different houses. Uh, but none of them conform but a lot of, to the idea of the, the dream house you've had, the literal dream house. Literal dream house. No, some sometimes I was at the literal dream house. Other times it was just other weird houses. Um, there was also a lot of like COVID mask stuff where I'd be in a grocery store and like no one was masked and I'd know in the dream to be freaking out. Like a lot of mm -hmm. weird COVID overlap. Um, but I actually, upon this moment here, doing this makes me feel like I should do it for longer because I gave up after like two months of recording them. But I don't remember, like I just read through some pages. I don't remember any of these. I noticed so that in, in, the, in the few like scant bits you gave us, um, yeah. those, were, those were good sentences. Um, I'm curious how much you think that you might be, I mean, do you feel like you sort of like edit, editorialize your dreams or that you sort of like narrativize them or do your dreams actually function as sort of like discrete sentences? Well, I also, when I was looking through these, found another dream where I just described it as like nonverbal, non-visual. It was like a feeling dream. And so it was really hard to write down because they didn't quite know what to like how to explain it and like, then a lot of times go ahead. yeah no go ahead did that feel like a challenge or did that feel like a sort of like an exciting thing to have been inside of to well a lot of times in this book um i write down like i don't feel like remembering the details like it was it sort of felt like a pressure to like remember this shit. yeah um but then I also just tried to practice like just like getting out whatever I could remember, even if the order was incorrect or like the, it was vague. And a, a lot of times when I was working on my book, I would dream sentences and then be like, this is the perfect sentence. I can't wait to wake up and write this down and then not remember when I woke up. <laughs> that was frustrating. Yeah. So Okay, so when you're dreaming a sentence, is it a thing where, like, what does it look like when you're inside of the space of dreaming a sentence? Is it words popping up and they're sort of, they have a relationship to the page and they have a specific font and those kind of things? Is it a voice? Like, what is it, what does it uh, look and feel like when there's a sentence that is at work? I think sometimes I would be like dreaming the scene almost and then that kind of that lucid thing where it's like as I'm dreaming it, I'm also on another level, like aware that I want to use that in the writing. Um, I, I don't know. I don't remember anywhere they like visualized in the air, but maybe, maybe even in the dream, like writing it down and being like, I have to remember this. So I'll write it in the dream and then wake <laughs> up and not remember what the sentence was. When you're, when you're writing the dream, is it the same technologies you're using to like, is it the same pen? Is it the same notebook? Is it uh, a computer? Is it a typewriter? Like, how are you writing them? I don't think I've ever dreamt of a typewriter. But, but uh, probably pen and paper. Do you feel like your handwriting is consistent? Is, is it, and also, is the speed the same? 
Um, I don't know. I don't do a ton of writing in the dream world. I'm usually like running away from bad guys or mm-hmm. I'm the bad guy. They're really quite adventurous. And I just, I wake up feeling so tired all the time. I think it might be because I'm like overactive in my dream state. Do you think that your your waking life would be enhanced by sort of like more pedestrian dreams where it was just like, someone goes to the top and it's fine instead of there being like a villain? Yeah, I do think some days when I feel better in the morning, it's because I've had like a really nice or like a super mellow dream. So I'm like not stressed. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. How do you normally write? Is it with pen and paper or is it um, on a computer? No, it's on, your phone? it's on a computer, like notes on my phone. Interesting. So do you think that the, the transposition of that kind of like observation and recollection as in just having had a dream, being in a notebook, did, does that mode of inscription, does that change the way that you're thinking about it? or like the speed at which you're processing experience in the dream or in the morning when I write it down either um I need a better pen because this pen is kind of illegible <laughs> like rereading these I couldn't read a lot of them um sometimes I'll I'll write down uh the dreams in a notes app and that's probably easier to just like get it out but um oh my god i was just gonna say something i totally forgot because i'm falling asleep um i did just buy some pens from amazon oh i know what i was gonna say i also seem to be really concerned with the distinction between dreams that i have at night and dreams when i'm taking a nap because i always make a note of it it'll just say nap dream and then i'll explain the dream so how are they different They don't seem to be that different in terms of content, but for some reason, I feel it's important to distinguish that in my record keeping. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I do think sometimes about that with dreams of like the nap dream or the sort of like, you know, it's like a super discrete unit of sleep, right? Like a nap is the the length of time on REM cycle. And there's, I don't know if there's like a different pressure flex, but also there's a, almost an arbitrariness to like the dreams you remember when you when you sleep, when you have your nighttime, your long sesh, where it's like you could have had like multiple dreams, but the one that you're yeah. the one that just happened to coincide with like your bladder. Being woken up or whatever, yeah. There's like a, a woodpecker where I'm saying right now, and that just like determines when the dream is over. <laughs> but a dream feels like a sort of like a standalone, it's like a, a short film instead of maybe the kind of more like televisual um, serialized form that maybe happens at night. Like maybe like at night when you have eight dreams, they constitute a season or they constitute mm-hmm. kind of like working out of the problem. Like, I don't know, maybe each one is getting to something, but they're sort of like they're drafts for each other or something like that. Well, actually, that reminds me of some dreams I have where I like wake up in the from the dream, but then I'm still in the dream, which I guess people that happens to a lot of people, right? Like, yeah, I don't know. Like you're like I'll even like wake up and like see myself sleeping in my bed, but know that I'm still dreaming, hmm. and it just feels like these like weird layered dreams that have, but they only seem to happen. Actually, I've had those during naps too. But I was thinking about what you're saying about like multiple dream cycles that kind of merge into each other over the course of a night. Yeah. How do you, do you feel like your, um, your dream life, how does your dream life affect your, your practice as a a painter, as a writer, as an artist in different ways? Like, do you, uh, do you let that in or does it feel like it's like a totally discreet thing? I think this conversation is making me want to get back into writing them down and then perhaps like revisiting them in a more structured way because like that thing about the wildflowers and like thinking yellow and having them turn green again like that's such a cool image for a story yeah um so i feel like i i want to maybe like give them space and then go back to them and see what i can what kind of material to take out 
from them. Um, so maybe I'll start trying to incorporate dreams more. I just think of them as like guidelines to uh, daily living. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I think one thing that's also interesting in, in terms of that, uh, so it's really like, I mean, you're not limited, but, you, but your primary um, modes of attack are our words and our watercolor and our like other kinds of paint, right? Um, yeah. Do you feel that one or the other is better disposed to specific visions, first of all, but secondly, um, a different way of like constructing a reality? Because there is a, there is a, um, an insistence on sort of like realism tweak through your own subjectivity that feels like it permeates your work. Uh, like it is, it feels like it's observational and it's about sort of like then trying to communicate to somebody else what that was like, as opposed to being obsessed with form or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like the, the sonics of language. And none of those are missing, but that that's not the primary interest that you have. Yeah. Yeah, I do think like, uh, when I when I write down my dreams, I am very it's still like that sort of journalistic sense of self that wants to get the like details correct more yeah. than wants to like interpret the symbolism um, necessarily. But then I think as a result, the symbolism is layered in there because it's like very detailed what I try and remember what I'm able to like extract from those so. But I don't know. I don't think I've ever like painted a dream, but that could be kind of fun. Just live in a dream, man. <laughs> I mean, for whatever it's worth, you're the first person to say live in a dream so far. I think that's like a really amazing. Well, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm only like your third guest, right? So, <laughs> yeah. How about you? Am I allowed to ask you about your dreams? uh we'll do that for the next episode okay um all right this was great have a this great was... day. thank and you thank you so much for being on the show thank what you a... for having me what a fun time what a fun maybe time. i'll maybe i'll dream of you tonight <laughs> right maybe that's the next episode like the follow-up being like did you have a dream you were interviewed by a person on the couch but they were <laughs> like what's going on yeah, they should do an episode too. <laughs> yeah, totally. All right, man. I'll see you soon. Good night. Love you. Thanks for being here. Love you. Bye. So Mikey, yeah. how has the pandemic affected your dream life? Um, I think it's made it a lot more serious and I think it's made me realize that I had been neglecting to value my dream life um, enough and it's provided an opportunity to reflect and eventually come to that point as well as an opportunity to try and be a little more present in my dream life. Are you always you in your dreams? Yeah, I guess I am. I guess I have only been me in my dreams. Are they often um, populated by people you know? Or who are the other people in, in them? You know, I guess they are usually populated with several characters that I know who are among a broader um, consortium of individuals, all of whom except for the two or three leading roles, aside from my omnipresent third person consciousness, um, I guess first person, yeah, since I'm me in my dreams, um, everyone else is kind of tuned out and just like a hole that you can't individuate out of. 
Interesting. Do you ever play music or or make um, paintings or drawings in your dreams? Um, the last dream I had, I was playing a concert, a show, but that was really more the setting. I didn't wasn't actually dreaming of what it was like to be on stage playing music or to be perceiving music. So I can't really speak to that other than to say I would like to, and if I have, I don't remember it at the moment. Could you hear, were the songs the keyboard was singing songs you remembered, or were they sort of new compositions, or was it like the peanut sound of just music generally? Well, now that you mention it, I feel like um, I could name a specific song he would be singing, but um, let me put it this way. I don't know if I'm making that up now, you know? Yeah. My memories aren't real, but they were real at the time. <laughs> Yeah, and especially to sort of like compound the unreality of dreams with the unreality of memory is a very... Right. I think that that's the thing we also often come across when thinking about dreams is that immediately upon refraction, reflection, they start to be sort of like transformed by waking logic. Yeah. And to go even further, how there can be in certain cases um, having to do with, for instance, um, his, the historical record or what have you. And um, our stories about anything, um, w something may be untrue. You may, um, you could sell a falsehood, but then if it goes down in history and it's like, it becomes the truth over time um, for the people who think it is and its origin matters no jot in terms of the um, consequence of to them, it's as real, you know? And in that way, it's fair to ask, um, you know, or not to ask, to um, contrarily rebut um, your parents, for instance, um, when, I guess, in this hypothetical situation, your parents are breaking it to you that Santa Claus is, you know, um, but are you sure? Because his picture is up all over the freaking place and all people do is talk about santa claus so are you sure he's not real pretty sure no one will shut up about him like in some ways that's a lot realer than a lot of things that were supposedly real right yeah what constitutes reality right yeah right it's also uh yeah like what about the saying something like blah, 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 like that's not a word and be like i don't know seems, but i think like we need to strive there. for um truth though and objective facts despite um you know my kind of like lazy general point in that direction of like nothing's real bro like yeah maybe there are some um fuzzy philosophical uh concepts uh we're not really thinking about um when we try and work it out but nevertheless um my biggest pet peeve is willful um ignorance and well so <clears throat> i mean do you also feel that there's like a little like a some tiny bit of chickens coming home to roostiness about Trump as related to the sort of like uh, postmodern squishiness and truthiness? Do we feel some sort of culpability for that? Or is that, I mean, is that a bridge too far? Or do you feel that those of us who are very comfortable with the sort of idea that like, what do you mean Santa Claus isn't real, he's real in this way? Is, do, is there any responsibility born for what's happened since? Um. I think Santa Claus definitely paved the way for Trump. I mean, I've been, you know, I've been trying to work to get Santa Claus impeached for a long time now. And among the issues I've always had with them was, um, one, first and foremost, the one that presents just an absolute danger to the freedom of people everywhere is Santa Claus's um, global surveillance state, which is illegal and immoral. and. I also have a big problem with Santa Claus, um, his kind of autocratic um, or fascist um, tendencies, which um, view him as the sole legitimate arbiter of naughty or nice. It's like, on what metric are you making that choice, dude? I also have a lot of concerns about the working conditions for elves. Every one of those is a great point. Um, Mikey. Yeah. Could you play us one more song? Yeah, sure.
Well, it was nearly something we said on your roof. You know we smoked cigarettes and we stared at the moon. And I showed you stars you never could see. It couldn't have been that easy to forget about me. Yeah, time meant nothing, anything seemed real. Oh, you could just light fire and you made me feel that every word you said was meant to be. It couldn't have been that easy to forget about me. To forget about me, cause baby, even the losers, they get lucky sometimes. Baby, even the losers, they keep a little bit of pride. They get lucky sometimes. Woo, ho, ho, ho! Thank you, Mikey. Thank you very much. Me? Ah, uh, nothing too crazy. The usual stuff. I mean, sometimes I dream that I'm a person. So, tonight, we've got a really wonderful guest. This is Adam Fulton Johnson, AFJ04, Adam Johnson. And he's a, an historian and a professor, a teacher, a writer, a thinker, um, someone who does a lot. And we're so glad to have him and I don't know, probably a dreamer. Let's admit him to the room. Adam. You there? Yes, hold up. Need video. This is a, this is a talk show. I know, I was in the bathroom. So no, also be like the late, 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 late show. I'm so glad to have you here. Um, Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about your dreams. What have dreams been like since you've been here recently? Well, as with most people, I think my memory is a challenging thing with regard to my dreams. I have few memories, I would say. My dreams are often vivid in a moment, I imagine <laughs> most people's are. But waking, they fade quite fast. I have, I have a tendency to wake up each morning around five. <clears throat> and- That's AM? 5 a.m. <laughs> yes, each morning, 5 p.m. 5 a.m. I have basically a small bladder <laughs> <laughs> makes me wake up every morning at, at a certain time, 4 or 5 p.m., 5, 5 a.m., sorry. And um, yeah, that sort of makes me uh, get up release <laughs> release the contents of my bladder and come back into bed and um 
I'll often be awake for like an hour at that time. However, putting a pillow over my head. I also often have a <clears throat> an eye shade made of silk. Do you think that the, the eye shade makes your dreams more more intense and more memorable, or? I think it just, just um, the sort of slight pressure right at the like sort of orbital bones around the eyes makes me feel comforted slightly, maybe inducing the dream state. Mm. But I don't know if it makes it more intense or more vivid. Do you think that, uh, I mean, are your dreams different if you're taking a nap than if you're taking your, your nighttime rest? Yeah, absolutely. My my dreams, I napped on the couch earlier today at about 4.30. I felt very tired. I knew that if I would read, I would fall asleep quite quickly. Um, and those will often follow the thread of the thing that I'm like working with. So I was reading a book and I, you know, became a character in a story or really in an architecture. Like the scene that the book is describing in that moment is the scene that I will inhabit. And the plot often doesn't come into play, but the, you know, the, the sort of like, the situation, the event, the moment is something that I'll like come to inhabit in that, in that like sort of day, daytime nap state. Um, Does that differ if you're watching or if you're reading a nonfiction or a fiction book? I never read nonfiction before bed. Um, Does that give people a greater I'm not sleepy. But um, that's a different, it actually induces a different kind of sleep, come to think of it. I read, <laughs> first of all, I read nonfiction in a professional way and almost never in a non-professional way. So that inducing of sleep will be more like nodding off, <laughs> nodding off. The other will as well, but I'm never reading nonfiction prone with a book over my head like this. Because they're bigger books they might fall on your face or? Uh, it's just like, I, I never want to fall, fall asleep when I'm reading non, when I'm reading nonfiction. Because of a sense of obligation? Absolutely. I, in fact, cannot read nonfiction like for pleasure. It, it think, does not is not pleasurable at all to me. You think that if you're reading things that are not for pleasure but are more sort of obligatory, that that creates a different sort of um, sense of anxiety or tension or obligation inside of the dream world? As I said, I don't think that I dream nonfiction. Like I don't have his I don't have historical dreams. Maybe occasionally I'll have some dream that's like clearly in a past time, but my dreams are um, oriented in two different ways, I think. One is oriented in my immediate past. And I, by that, I mean like my own past any number of years, but not before my birth or oriented into a future. So like situated in a future time where, yeah, where there are, you know, sort of like novel technologies mm. or situations that are like not physically possible today. Well, but so also maybe interesting also for the audience that Adam teaches among other things about the the history of science, and so I'm, I'm interested also that the, the that also encompasses like the future of science as a, 
a key component of your dream world. So these are these dreams happening in June of 2021 or are they happening in, you know, 24, 24? I would say both, or I have dreams about both. I have dreams about future worlds that um, are not really about the nitty gritty of the technology or something like that, but just sort of the events happen there, right? There's not fantasy technologies. There's not even, there's not even like sort of, um, You know, perhaps there are like novel things that um, I've never comprehended in my waking life, but, you know, often it's, it's sort of like, where are you walking? What is your destination? And why do you need to go there? And those have, as many peoples have, anxieties, right? I need to deliver this thing. I haven't prepared for this other thing. I want to see this person. They're not, you know, the the setting, it's interesting that the setting is oriented into the future as a historian, someone who's primarily concerned with the past, but as a historian concerned with questions about how people in the past imagine their future. So the way that, you know, indigenous communities in 1900 imagined their future. I actually don't inhabit those subjectivities uh, personally in my real world, but also like not even in my dreams. Um, but for my own subject position feel placed in those future settings with contemporaneous anxieties. Are there any um, technologies that you've experienced during dreams that you have either seen or have been able to like articulate after the fact as being something specific, something you're saying you could deal with? Like, are there, are there technologies that you, you've dreamt about and then thought about in waking life? So you're asking about sort of like imagining a like a, a sort of like instantaneous transport transport system or a type of communication that is you know in inner ear or something like that, right? Like future tech. Well, I feel like you just answered that question. That those are examples of <laughs> things you've experienced in your dreams, but maybe we don't have yet. So some sort of like uh, the teleportation device, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think I actually, I would venture to guess that many people feel or have that experience, even if it's not articulated in a, like a discrete technology where you are in a dream space, you're in your house or a very familiar space and suddenly you sort of warped to another zone that is, you know, discontinuous with that space in real time. Yeah. But but you've you sort of like suddenly like warped there, and it makes sense in the dream. Yeah. And Funny. I, I think often of, of those things in terms of cinema, just because that's part of my background. But in terms of like the 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 dream logic as a, a type of like almost like film editing that is about like moving through spaces in different ways. And we're, we're very used to that in film that like 60 years can take place or three years or half a minute. And that's like the cut. Um, but so I, I guess maybe a question I have for you then is about, I mean, I know that you're interested in like science fiction and speculative fiction. Do you think, do you think that those fundamentally function as dreams of the future? Um, it depends on the, t the type that you're reading, I suppose. Um, sorry, your question is about dreams, not about science fiction. It's about um, science fiction. Like does, does science fiction function as a dream? Or maybe, maybe a different question actually also is in terms of, I mean, in terms of these kind of like, uh, 
genre fiction. So like speculative fiction, sci-fi, fantasy, part of how we differentiate the two of those is that one is in like a, a, a kind of future and one is in like an indiscernible past frequently, um, just in terms of their use of technology and uh, the way that they, yeah, think about whatever costumery and all these kind of things in technology. So because you are like specifically interested in technology, I'm curious um, about that. Do you, do you feel like your dreams function more similarly to, and these are, you know, very brutish genre distinctions, but like sci-fi or like fantasy? Yeah, I, I actually do think that they have in like an imprint and like tropes that fit genre fiction perhaps maybe not like explicitly fantasy though i love fantasy um i don't often have dreams where i'm in like a sort of like proto medieval-ish world that has you know like <laughs> plate armor and swords and fighting and things like that we look at love indulging in that timescape as a consumer, as like someone who like enjoys stories and um, and sort of like the aesthetics around something like that. With the science fiction aspect, I mean, that's a, you know, that could, that's a genre that can encompass almost anything, but it is more frequent in my dreams. It's more, it's a timescape that I touch on more often, maybe. Um, and I think that's sort of what I'm, what one gets at in dreams is that there are, you know, scenarios that have those genre fictions, um, like fictional spaces rely on aesthetic tropes that like signal to the, the, you know, the viewer or the consumer or whatever where you are and like what the sort of vibe is. And I think dreams have that without the same, they don't even need the same aesthetic cues because sometimes in a dream you'll have that just feeling, right? For instance, you've, you've been in a dream of mine and you don't necessarily look like Jesse, but the, the dreamer knows that it's Jesse. The dreamer knows that it's, um, you know, this person from their past that they haven't spoken to in 10 years, they don't look like that person. It's not an updated version of that person, but there's a sort of like um, experiential knowledge. Yeah, it's yeah, that the thing of being like aware this is somebody, even if they are signified in a different way. And in fact, they're often like some, you know, the, an interesting thing about this, and we were talking about this the other day, but um, right, it's sometimes in a dream, you have an experience of a person. They don't look like that person. So that, like, there's no evidence out, outside of the dreamer about who that person is, right? They don't look like them. They don't act like them. And you know, that would be a sort of like inductive way of describing this. But we talked the other night about abduction, right? Experience as the way that you derive data or feeling as the way that you derive data. And that's how the dream works in a way, because it's sort of like, it doesn't matter what anyone else says, right? It doesn't matter that, um, you know, all um, all birds have feathers, you know, and this person has feathers, so they're a bird, right? It's not that kind of reasoning, which is deductive, but it's it is it is sort of like felt only. And because the dreamer's experience is absolutely unique, it doesn't matter the kinds of other evidence that you would would say to a person and when you describe the dream if you were in the dream but you looked like a cat or a like my you phone know, do that by the way yes <laughs> you, i mean that's or like a bear maybe that's how you would appear and but that that's almost like too sort of like um 
right. so yeah. Yeah. there's something about that amazing feeling and this happens the most interesting time that this happens actually is is you'll be like okay this is a friend of mine who you know i uh used to go on long runs with but in the and it and like it's tom and in the dream it's just it's like another person um who you know is much shorter has like a bushier beard and is like in a bar and is very drunk in the dream but you're still sort of like it's tom even though they have no associations uh with with one another like in your life you don't associate tom with those things but you're still sort of like it's actually this person and they're doing this thing for me um or they are they're like here for this reason and it's very challenging for the dreamer afterwards to sort of like make those connections they'll be like i could describe the dream but if i were to describe tom it wouldn't be the tom who goes on long runs but i know that the drunk in the bar was still tom um that's interesting. Okay, so I, I have one yeah, last question. I think, I think that's interesting. Actually, that feeling hasn't happened to me in a while, and 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 um and I wonder, you know, if that if that sort of experience is is common in dreams and just not the ones that I remember, or how that how that's working. I wonder also about that in terms of uh, COVID, of just like how many fewer people one is interacting with. Um. I have one last question and then we'll let you go. But um, you, you keep saying the dreamer and I'm interested in that, but I can't help but wonder how often are you not yourself in a dream? Do you ever have an avatar or do you function as someone else? Do you encounter yourself in dreams ever as an object, not as a, not as a subject? Yeah, I think that I have. I don't think that it's 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 as common, but I remember where I have like a sort of like sense of being affected by waking up and being sort of like, I was watching something else. It was me, but it was like a more distant me or something that, um, yeah, that had, I'm struggling to have a very specific example of this, but I do have the direct, you know, the sense of this ability to displace people onto people. I mean, you know, I, and I, and I think that I mean what I say when I say people onto people, because it seems like the people in dreams are not sort of like, droids or like computer generated like in pcs right it's more that they are people that you've met and are like caricaturing or just installing into this space yeah. um so because we make those dissociations like or or like replacements within the dream sometimes they'll like you know <laughs> the like uh person you meet on the street is actually like a, a pretty old friend of yours that you haven't been in contact with for a long time um and that's it's like pretty random and incidental and like doesn't you know can be interpreted but is also just sort of like oh i just like put this person into this role right here right so think, so, so it, talk about the self is what i i'm trying to say is yeah. that like you can do that for your own character, right? Um, dreams are scenarios. Uh, so so you can, I don't know, you can just take, you can take different perspectives in it. That's that's all I, all I can say. Okay, so I said it was the last question, but I have one more because it was based also on this idea of kind of like the avatar, you say dreamer than like character, so there's a way that it is related, I think, um, to me at least with the way that video games work, also NPC, right, non-playing character, like these sort of like null things you can like run into and they can just keep doing the same things over and over again. Um, 
do you find more often that in terms of your dreams, if there was a camera, if you're experiencing them visually, is it here or is it here? Let me get that for the camera. In the way that like uh, many video games, like you can like see the person's hands, but you can also see like the top of their head, or is it just like directly as if they were, the camera was your eyes? Is it a surrogate for your eyeballs? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think personally, it, it's both and it's a mixture and it's, you know, the dream is an interesting way of like uh, toggling between those two things. So in video games, we call that first person and the one that where the camera's behind is like a three fourths perspective or just third person camera. Mm -hmm. um, excuse me. Um, and I do experience both in my dreams. I can't, you know, it, it would be interesting to ask that about to a lot of people because I, I would also sort of like my um, way, I like, I like interact with simulations a lot. So the way that my like brain understands um, perspective, in like a simulated reality, which a dream could maybe be interpreted as, um, has like a couple different camera angles. Yeah. Um, and it, it is funny because I, I have like, you know, glimpses of dreams, which I can't remember in full, but like, which are from a third person perspective where you're sort of watching yourself and it's never, you're really watching yourself like face on. It's sort of like this kind of like behind you perspective. And it is like implicit to the dreamer that you are the person that you're also watching. Um, so yeah, I think that's, I mean, do you have both perspectives? I think I'm usually, um, it's, it's pretty much like that the, the dream camera logic more often than one would think for someone who thinks a lot about cameras is almost always from my perspective. Like I rarely see myself in dreams. Um, Do but you I'm feel like you have uh... But I mean, I mean, I'm into that idea of, 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 of uh, yeah, existing in like multiple modalities, but I think that, um, I don't know. I'm asking people these questions, but I also like have employed some of myself, but I feel like of myself, but I feel like generally I perform some version of myself and I am experiencing the world somewhat cinematically, but mostly from my own perspective. Like it's, it, it's, uh, also, it's closer to I can turn to questions. Like, do you also have this displaced, like you're actually sort of another character? Yeah, I mean, I also, I, I will say I also, just even thinking of in the last week, um, have dreams sometimes where I'm not even there. Like they do function much more like as a film of like, that the that I'm just not there, I'm just like the audience for it. And it's meant to be um, interpreted and internalized and understood by me. It's for me, but I'm the audience in that moment. Like I'm not, I wasn't there during this thing. And it's not just somebody, well, sometimes it's like somebody kind of, relating a story to me. And then all of a sudden we're like in the world of a flashback. Um, but sometimes, yeah, I think that's like a, a relatively common thing, but also it's like times when I'm like, I'm, I'm not there, but I'm just like experiencing the world happening. Hmm. Yeah, and I wonder how many like, I would find a dream like that to be maybe like stark and memorable in the moment, but also like hard to remember afterwards where you are not present. Um, yeah. Well, I wonder also, I mean, I mean, because like, I'll, I'll... I think it's just something also yeah. that is related to, and you were describing earlier of like, what are the, uh things that a person is maybe like experiencing right before they fall asleep and if that is video games versus cinema versus a book the different levels of absorption and also like the theoretical level of agency for the person experiencing them 
um, how those might impact the way that the dreamer experiences the world. Right. Hmm. Um, Adam F. Johnson, Dr. Adam Johnson, this was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the late, 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 late show. Do you have anything to plug or do we just go to sleep? <laughs> unplug. Okay. Perfect unplugging. Um, good night. Thank you so much. That was, that was beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Is the chef, is the chef kiss just smoking weed? Chef kiss is just pulling on that joint. <laughs> Chefs love weed. Okay. Good night, Adam. Thank is you. So that it? Good night, man. Welcome back to the late, 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 late show. I'm your host, Jesse Melvin. Our next guest is an old friend of the program a dreamer in many senses of the word, an artist, a thinker, a liver, a teacher of the youth. Please welcome Lauren Walsh.
Why, hello. Hello. Welcome to the show, Lauren. We're so happy Hi. to have you. Hello. I'm so happy to be here. Is this a dream? It, it feels that way sometimes. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm all right. Just haven't really done much. <laughs> how uh, that's not true. It's how have your how have your dreams been recently? Really weird. I mean, not any weirder than normal, but I don't know. Sticking with me. Oh yeah. Strange in a good way. Will you will you tell us the usual? That? Um. Well, I wrote down one the other day because I woke up and was like, oh, that was, it was really long. And I wrote, I like started taking notes about it. I had one last, last night when I woke up this morning, I was like, oh, that, that's another good one. And I like looked at my phone for a long time. So I, sorry, my cat's being bad. And uh, I forgot it. Cause you know, when you look at the news for too long, it's not, it's not good. You got to like really think, lay there and think about it for a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I had a really weird one the other night. I had one, I had a really weird one the other night that was really long. And sometimes you don't even realize you're having like a work stress dream until later. I was like talking about it out loud to myself and, uh, realized, oh, this is a stress dream, hmm. which I've been having a lot of lately as well because work stuff. Yeah. Um, so, so tell but, us about it. You know, where you like do all the work. So I was driving to work at some point in this dream, driving to work is a part I be remember the beginning. And, but I was like going the wrong way. And it was something like we were going back to work. I'm a teacher. There's like this whole thing. We're like going back to work soon. So I'm like driving to work and I'm like, I forgot how to drive to work. And I'm like, I'm not driving to work. I'm driving the wrong way. This is so silly. So I like did a U-turn and then I was on Damon and Roosevelt. And then I started going West on Roosevelt. I had been going South on Damon, which doesn't make sense. It's not toward my work, but I turned around and was like, I have to go this way. And on Roosevelt, there was like all of these weird things were in the way. Like there was like a truck pulled over and I like had to go around it. And then there was like all these weird obstacles kind of like, Oh, go this way. And then there was like this big fight outside of the store and people were like unloading something from a truck and I swerved around it. And then there were, then the whole road was blocked off. So I had to turn right down a side street. And at that point I was like, there's some people, there was like all of a sudden people, you know, and I was like, Oh, you guys, they were also on their way to work with me. They were my call, my coworkers. And I was like, hop in the car, because they were using some other sort of mode of transportation. I'm unclear. But they got in the car, and when they got in the car, my car sank to the ground, like, <laughs> just, like, wouldn't move. It was, like, too heavy. And I was like, oh, man, you guys, this is so weird. This is embarrassing. I never have anyone so tall in my car. I think you guys must be weighing it down. And the two, the co there was one coworker in the back, one coworker in the passenger seat, and the coworker in the passenger seat was that skateboarding ocean spray guy from the internet. <laughs> I don't know who the other guy was. He was just a nondescript guy, but I, the one coworker, and in my dream, he was very tall and very big, and I was like, "You're just, I think, I think you're just too big for the car." And so, uh, so, but they, but then we somehow, somehow, the car started working again, and then they're driving. And I had the Google Maps like thing on, you know? And then it was like, you know how when you like go to Indiana or something and it's like, welcome to Indiana. Like on the mm -hmm. Google, like the Google lady says it. She was, they did an announcement like that, but she was like, this is the like count so-and-so's territory. And it was like a, telling you what gang territory you were going in and that it was dangerous. Mm. It's so weird. And I was like, and in my dream, I was like, well, that's, weird when did they start doing that <laughs> and then, so we like started driving and we're driving through this neighborhood and then this is the part that didn't make sense some well i mean the rest of it totally made sense but um there there's some kind of blur here in my timeline of the dream but 
there was also this other portion of the dream where I can't tell which order these were in, but I was at a restaurant with two of my real coworkers in real life. And we were like, we got to go. We got to hurry. We have to get out of here. We're going to be late for work. It's the first day back. And we were like, oh my God, we got to go. And so we like rushed out of there. I'm like, we're totally late. I haven't even set up my classroom. It was like CPS was like making us go back. It was like emergency. Like suddenly we had to go back. And I was like, we got to go. And so then I can't, I know that that, I remember that part very distinctly because it put that feeling in me of like, now all of a sudden I'm really late for work because I was going to work in the first part. I don't know. That would happen somewhere. But then we're walking through this field and it's in this neighborhood where we had taken this detour still kind of. And I was like, hang on. I don't know if we just like stopped there or something, but now we're in this field and I'm on foot. And I was following this other group of people no, one of which was Stella's younger brother, Harry. It was the, every once in a while, you know, there's like one random person that you like a real life person. Yeah. There's another other group of nondescript people. But we were walking and I was like, on the ground, there was all these cardboard cutouts. There's like a, you know, a couple open lots of no houses, you know, on the corner. And there's all these pieces of cardboard on the ground and they were <laughs> cut out like painted like Pokemon <laughs> and I was like ha ha and I picked one up and was like I caught it was a Lapras which is like a seafaring Pokemon it's like kind of like the Loch Ness monster type of thing okay and I grabbed it and was like, look I caught a Lapras <laughs> I, I don't know I was catching these cardboard Pokemon that someone had laid out like I thought it was hilarious <laughs> in my dream like look how funny it and then I picked up a couple other ones. It's like, ah, and then they picked up one. It was like, it's an oddish, which is this really adorable Pokemon that looks like a radish. And when, I, and I pulled it out of the ground, like a giant radish. And as I pulled it, suddenly I had a real radish in my hand and I went, and I was like, this is like to the people around me. It was like, this is so funny. I have a real radish. That was weird. And then I was like, I'm really late for work, you guys. I really got to go. Like, this is so fun. I want to stay here. But, like, I really have to go to work. And then people started coming out of the house where they also – then I noticed all these other, like, cardboard decorations. And then suddenly there was, like, a party. Like, people started coming out of the house. They're like, oh, we were just about to have a party, though. And I was like, I can't. I have to go to work. Like, I really have to go. Like, I have to go to work. And But then it was, like, a party. And then – there was food, they had all these tables set up. And so then it was like, the next thing I knew, I'm like sitting at this table, you know, the timeline is weird and talking to this person. And I'm like, man, I'm having such a really good time, but I really have to go to work. And then I went, I don't know, the, I think that might be the end of what I remember about that one. Oh, I was telling the person that like, I not, like I don't, you know, I don't have my class set up yet. Like, I really have to go. Like, you should see it. There's, like, chairs piled up. And then when I was telling myself this dream the other day out loud, because I was, like, talking to myself about it, and I was like, oh, that's when I realized, like, this was a work stress dream. I just thought it was a really funny dream. Yeah. It, but it was. Um, um, do, you, do you find often that, I mean, when you were describing the experience of... Um, inside of the dream thinking that something is funny and there being sort of like an audience for that when of course this is all happening inside of your head do you feel do you feel funny and do you feel like you're making jokes to other people in in dreams often okay is, is humor kind of um humor inside of the dream too not sort of like self-reflexively afterwards hmm, it definitely was in this one i'm trying to think of like other situations but I feel like that I mean yeah I don't see why not of course I'm going to dream that I'm hilarious and everyone's paying attention and laughing <laughs> along with me that like is of course that's what I would dream about uh but that's very much how that was like I was like making all these elaborate jokes about the Pokemon everyone was just like <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was great but I was so late for work so <laughs> You didn't have to explain who the Pokemon were because they were like, no, no, this is such a good joke that I get it fully. No, I, in my dream, I did kind of. Just some people were like, what are you talking about? I was like, it's Apron. <laughs> my Pokemon knowledge is very extensive. I, what, um, uh, did, do you, I just, do you talk like, to... In my dream, I'm like, I just want to understand. 
do you talk to your students about about dreams? What 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 what? How does that? Sorry, Sorry you can you say? Um, we, it's come up before. I like guess. Hmm. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, I was peeling an orange. <laughs> um. Uh, we, we it's come up before. We get to like right now. When I'm, I'm virtual, each fifth grade till they're like eleven ish. And we just like talk for a lot of the day right now because it's like virtual teaching. So like every day they, everyone gets a chance to share. We just talk about whatever they want. And we've gotten into some, to some that way because then it's like anything comes up, you know, it's like, like whatever they want. And um, we've definitely talked about dreams a little bit. Sometimes kids have told me some of the dreams. I can't remember any specifically, but sometimes I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> like, that's crazy. And do you think, that, I mean, do you feel like- I mean, dreams in general are. Is the, is the way that they talk about them, does it feel similar to the way that adults talk about them in that kind of way of re reflecting back on the times when it makes sense, what doesn't make sense, that being a sort of an important part of it, the way that they narrate it, does it feel like a sort of similar thing? I feel like kids don't really laugh as much about the things that don't make sense because uh, nothing makes sense to them ever. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if that's why, but I feel like, I don't know. I feel like when I was a kid, I didn't so much think about like, well, that was weird. I just was like, yeah, it's just, I don't know. That's just the way it is. I, I guess I never really thought about it. As an adult though, you're like, yeah, why is the ocean spray skateboarding guy in my dream? That's so weird. And as a dream, I would just be like, yeah, it's the person from TV, like whatever. Yeah. Did you reflect more on why, no. why him? Is, is it his like his extreme chillness, ability to go with the flow and the desire for that compared to the <laughs> difficult uh, track you had? I kind of, I kind of was thinking about it the next day. So I was like, what the hell? <laughs> why that guy? It was pretty funny. And I did, I did feel like it was like a very funny, like, it, like if it were like the persona that that guy has like, got on the internet is very like oh, i'm so chill i just want to be like this guy like this guy is a whole mood uh -huh. and like i did think about that in my dream like oh yeah that's like like i mean i guess that guy is just like his whole mood <laughs> yeah and the polar opposite of being like i'm really late for work <laughs> though it's also funny that he wanted We're to rock the thing we most know about him is that he's riding a skateboard it's like all i know is how he gets around that was, I did, I, yeah, it's like, oh, well, of course it's that guy. Like, someone needs a ride? Oh, it's, I don't know, it's weird, man. I wonder why people, certain people show up in my dreams all the time. Are there other people that are, that are um, recurrent characters? No, it's always just, like, random people. Like, someone that I know, like, another dream I had the other night, it was, like, an old friend from, like, Michigan. And then the next day he like messaged me about something random. And I was like, I didn't say you were in my dream last night, even though I really wanted to do it. But sometimes people are like, what? why are you telling me this? Well, for... I mean, it's weird when you see that person, you don't, or sometimes you don't realize and you see that person, you're like, oh God, like you were in my dream. I, when I was in middle school, I have, remember I had a dream, a romantic type dream. Mm. And I was like in junior high and there guy at school who was really mean to me this like boy who was like so mean and I saw him at school I remember seeing him at school like the next day and I didn't even remember it but then I saw him at school and I was like <gasps> like immediately it like came back to me and I was like ew and I remember being so upset because I hated him so much I was like why did I have that dream why would my brain do that to me funny that was like one of the first times I was feeling very like violated by my dream like mad you know, about something that I dreamed. I was probably in like seventh grade. Interesting. Do you remember what the sort of, what was the, the resource for that then? Was it, or what was the sort of thinking? Was it that, that the brain had betrayed you, that it was trying to reveal something to you? Like what is the, the relationship between the two? I remember feeling betrayed. I felt very betrayed by my brain. Like I was like, like what the hell? Like, why would you do that? Interesting. I don't know. It's funny. It's weird how weird things appear in dreams. The ocean spray skateboarding guy, though, not mad about it. Yeah, he's charming. <laughs> it was a good one. And also, what if there's I some, had another uh, dream. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
No, I was going to tell you about this this other dream that I had the other day that I had I had texted you that I woke up. I think I texted you a screenshot of it because I woke up and like sometimes I get in the habit of like looking at my phone too fast and I saw a message and I responded to it. And someone had been like, how are you? And I was like, I'm really mad about this dream. I was like kind of still dreaming. But that moment where you wake up and you're like mad that that thing didn't happen, you know, like where you dream that you like get ready for work and you like did all the things you like get ready for work and you're like ready to go to work and then you wake up and you're like, well, I have to do it all again. Like I just did that. Does that happen to you? Yeah, definitely. Okay. It was like that, but I had been in my dream. I had been like all these other things happened, but throughout the dream, I was like applying, like methodically applying this hair dye to my hair. Like very, huh. like this, I went, I went to cosmetology school. So this is like wave in the deep back of my brain. So I was like in my, my, my brain, like applying it in the way in, in which we would in cosmetology school, like very like perfect partings and like putting it on with the brush. And it's very, I don't know, it's very soothing kind of. You like section the hair into all these pieces. And throughout the dream, I was like riding my bike. I was grocery shopping at Stanley's, which doesn't exist anymore. But then it was also a movie theater doing all these things but throughout the dream I was I was applying this hair dye and I remember waking up the first thing I thought when I woke up was it took me so long to put that hair dye on and now I never get to see it <laughs> like I that was my first time waking up I was so mad I'm like god I was just putting that hair dye on for like a whole day well that would really my brain was still like kind of holding on to it like this really just happened and like also knowing that I'm awake and you, I don't know, it's weird. You're in that like in-between stage where you like know you're awake, but you also are kind of still dreaming. Yeah, that's, that's funny. Weird. I think there's also something about, I mean, that, that specific type of betrayal you're describing of um, like doing your, your morning routine and then waking up to discover you have to do it again, which I think about sometimes yeah. in terms of also like other kinds of play, if dream is a little bit of a kind of play other sort of like leisure spaces where a person performs work. Like if somebody's like playing The Sims and like they, but they don't have their job, they have a different job. So it doesn't feel like they're doing labor for free, but there's something about it being, and so like, I feel like if you're doing a totally different routine, you don't wake up resenting it. But if it's the one that you're about to have to do with no variation, it's not as if like your cat can talk during or something like that, that it does feel sort of like, wait, 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 I mm -hmm. just, uh, there's a redundancy, but like there's, yeah. there's also pleasure in, in the labor when it's a different kind of thing. Yeah, it's probably, I mean, I mean, the whole phenomenon, I'm sure, is what they're like, oh, Groundhog Day, I'm going to write this movie now. <laughs> it's like kind of the same, you know, they're like, oh, it's the same kind of like, yeah, feeling. We're just like, oh, great, now I have to do this again. I just did this. Mm -hmm. But maybe it'll be like slightly different. I don't know. I, do you, I have that kind of situation. Do you, uh, how do you respond when, if somebody tells you that you were in their dream, do you feel a sort of uh, an ownership over what you did or anything or? Sort of, I like it. I'm like, what was I doing? I'm like, wow, would I really do that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I do think about it. I also think it's funny to hear, like if it's something that I would like not do, I'm like, weird. What do you think about me? Uh -huh. but then it, I don't know. I also feel like, I don't know. I try not to read too hard into dreams. I, I tend to just kind of be like, oh, I could see why that was in there, but not to be like, well, what does it mean too deeply? Yeah. Because I'm like, who knows? I don't want to fixate on some wrong message, you know? Yeah. I think we can also think about it deeply, but, but I, not directly. Like it doesn't have to be that it's a, that the ocean spray person represents your interest in being whatever, like there can be something sure. more expansive of being like in, in the mush of, of media life and media mind, these things rise to the surface or yeah. something. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what day that was. Wonder like what was going on that day, you know? I can't remember, it was some days, oh wait. Oh, it was Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. Yeah, then I woke up to a weird day, but I kind of thought about that all day. Yeah, but it wasn't a premonition was about, about the about uh, dream about the, about the coup that happened. Yeah. I don't think so. Of being like motion screen. <laughs> I did think about this. 
He's um, going to save us. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show, Lauren. Thank you for having me. A real dream guest. Um, well, I hope that you have uh, a wonderful night's sleep and you have uh, a series of dreams with no getting lost and no going to work and just uh, leisure, but still hopefully like, you know, friends, brothers and meme stars and all yeah. those things. All the good, all the good part points of a dream. Yeah. Something totally bizarre. Yeah. Bizarre, yeah, chopped up really time. The best of. Yeah. That's how I feel like that dream was. I was like, well, it's funny. Oh, it was because I went to sleep at night and I was like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to dream something really good tonight. And I, at first, most <laughs> of the night I had very bad, stressful dreams. And then I finally went to sleep like, you know, like at some point in the middle of the night, I had fallen asleep, and that's when I had this dream. And I remember waking up and being like, "God, I, I really thought at least I did have a good dream." Because before I went to bed, I was like, "I'm gonna have a good dream tonight." <laughs> that's good. You have to like, set your set your intentions. You have to have these sort of affirmations for for wake, waking life and sleeping life. That your purpose for dreaming, like, all right, this is what I'll see. Maybe you can get like specific things to come in. Yeah. And that's also probably the better um, affirmation and aspiration of being like, I'm going to start doing yoga in my dreams. Uh, I'm going to start going to bed earlier. I'm going to start eating more broccoli, you know, like having uh, the time for a much more interesting approach to the resolution. The things I suck at doing in my waking life. I'm like, oh, so sorry. There's a weird sound coming from the other room. All right. <laughs> okay. Good night, Lauren. Good night, sweet dreams. Sweet dreams. <laughs>so honored to have our next guest an artist working in performance and video and collage and astrologer and someone with always the most interesting interesting things to say about so many topics and someone who helps a lot of people sort of think through their own lives as determined both by the stars and their individual practices. And I think a little bit of <clears throat> on the fly psychology. So welcome, if you will, to the Zoom room, Blair Bogan. Jesse. Claire. How are you? I'm fine. For some reason I like forgot this was a video Zoom thing and I'm like adjusting to that. Okay. Well, it's a, it's a talk show. It's just that we happen to be in different places. So Zoom 
and also um, the pandemic. Right. Well, I like was waiting to just hear your voice on my phone. Mm -hmm. And um, not have to be seen. But um, I'm learning to be okay with this. Okay. Well, if it makes sense, we can both close our eyes. Or we can sure. the audience too. Um, well, this is delightful to actually see you. So you can close your eyes. I'll, I'll watch this happening. Well, it's great to see you. Um, tell me a bit about what you've been dreaming about recently. I worried you would ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Um, this is cool because I've been kind of like creating a dream map where like I keep having dreams in the same places. And so I've like, I've created this map of my dream world. And currently I am like in this airport hotel that's very lush, like gold, golden elevators and uh chandeliers and everyone's in a pencil skirt like the, the last like three nights i've been in this uh environment sometimes it's at a carnival um oh i go to bloomington indiana a lot mm -hmm. um anyways it's a lot of some um, rep repeating characters sometimes childhood friends, all the time, my mother bursting through a door, um, ex-lovers, birds. Do the birds behave like birds do? In ways, they're, they're um, um, and sometimes, yeah. But like, they're not like wearing top hats or anything. They're like, you know, I, a, one bird acted like a dog once, like it had a stick in its mouth. Very cute. But like a, in like a dog way, not in like a bird building a nest, but in a dog being like, throw this, I'm gonna go get it again. I love this game. It was more like, you know, when dogs like have the stick and like almost break their neck. <laughs> Um, like, yeah. I feel like that's like the, around the, stick. the great ways of sort of like mapping um, a very human thing of being maybe sometimes unable to express one's desires, but being like, all the dog wants is for you to throw the stick again. But at the same time, they're so nervous that if they get rid of it in that moment, that they'll never see it again. And being like, part of the pleasure is the fight. And then, but then you can be like, you know, I'm done here. This is disgusting. It's slobbery. And they're like, Oh, you can have it. <laughs> yes, that that's true. That's how I would interpret it too. If there, if that, if there was a dog in my dream, trying to throw a stick, I would be like, "Oh, there's some sick, like hot desire I have for not getting my needs met." Yeah. So, do you do you most mornings uh, you spend some time thinking about the the the, the, the lives you just lived in dream in dream world oh my gosh I like it's like my morning I have this little thing <clears throat> I lay in bed and turn this on which is like a recording device oh wow okay and I will just go off on what just happened and it's a little USB so I then I have a, has the date and everything on it I have a whole archive of years and years of dreams. And how often do you listen back to them? Or is it more about the process of like a sort of audio inscription? Yeah, never. <laughs> Maybe I'll make a, a, a project of it one day. Um, it, it is just a way for me to like say it out loud and so that I just like build that muscle of remembering you found, them. You found that, that, that speaking it 
is better than writing it or drawing it or other modes of personal use? Yeah, well, I think that like the moment you wake up, you're compromising the dream. Like the moment you like literally to like sit up from from your bed is to like for me is to like disrespect the dream that just happens. Like it's just like I really loved like sitting and letting the dream still exist while I like just comprehend it its wholeness yeah but like it just being able to grab that without moving so much are your eyes closed when you when you say it yeah do you ever fall back asleep while you're speaking a dream like sort of getting back into that space sometimes sometimes i wish i would if it's like a good dream um, most of the time, like I start getting a little like analyze -y, wake myself up, just like realizing my, like my, my neurosis about something, you know, mm -hmm. I start on, start on my days, just feeling very Jewish and, <laughs> and, Ooh, my phone's going to die. So, so that's actually, um, I mean, one thing that I'm sort of curious about also, maybe you can talk about this, but there's something about that thing of if you're describing the dream and then you start to move into analysis, does that, how does that match onto your other creative practices? I know that for many people, one of the sort of challenges is that like, when you're in the midst of working on something in the flow state, when you're improvising, let's say, whether that's studio based or on stage or something like that, is how to not sort of like get into the analysis side too quickly. Um, like how to sort of like balance those two states, the sort of like the artist and the critic or the person who can then, you know, like in a draft stage wants to be sort of like moving and then you can go back and do that. Um, does that, I guess I'm not sure what the question is inside of there, but, but I mean, do you feel like there's like a sort of similar thing with that, that you're trying to maintain the level of distance of being still inside of it and then the analysis can happen afterwards and that can sort of help build a thing? Yeah. Um, yes, I hear what you're saying. Um, right, like, I feel like analysis is just so white capitalist, like, <laughs> you're like scrounging for the, the value in this thing. Like, I, like, I like being a little more like, and this is sort of a James Hillman idea of like not wanting anything from the dream, like letting the dream like just like be marinated in its like like symbolness, like letting the symbols just like rest as they are. <clears throat> and basically similar to like making art, you're like letting like the beauty exist as it is. And then, yeah, I suppose like, you know, after I do that, I'm just so hell bent on like getting to know myself. So I then I'm like, okay, what is my unconsciousness trying to tell me here? And then I really get the critic going. Um, but there is that nice like bliss of, of just like appreciating the beauty of the dream at first. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I wonder also, like, you know, maybe this is not the goal for all people, but I think that, uh, <clears throat> and this could, I think we could use as a description for certain kinds of art making as well as for dream making, but whether or not the idea is sort of like to attain a kind of clarity or if it is about, um, like that's maybe one thing that can happen through arts education or something like that is like getting more honed in terms of like the critical voice and learning how to like, do the things you want to do. And another thing is sort of like building up um, one's own sensorium and, and one's ability to sort of like experience things in different ways and to trigger experiences in different ways, but not necessarily towards the goal of making a thing that then has like easy symbols, but rather as a way of like luxuriating inside of the space. And I wonder if there's ways that 
Um, one can think about dream making, dream making, that's even a funny way to describe that, but dreaming is something where it's like that you can hone the skills of dreaming better. And by that, just meaning not sort of as a direct link to what you're secretly feeling, but rather as like a sort of uh, another aesthetic experience for one, two mm. of. Yeah, like people would, people are selling their dreams, their dreamscapes. <laughs> as a, um, yeah, a Disneyland. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm all for like these yogic dreaming uh, practices or just like lucid dreaming um, that are, I think, I mean, you know, lucid dreaming is not so much about like have to get to know myself it's more about like i want to like feel like the sensations of like flying and going and like fucking my third grade teacher or like like i want to feel like boundless and do whatever i want in this dreamscape like it is kind of like a um disneyland um Well, so yeah. then maybe related to that is like, I mean, what do you think about this idea of maybe that the kind of lucid dreaming is about, you know, exerting your will and desire in this other space, whereas the ways that people describe dreams sometimes is more that they are the audience for it or that they are like at the, at the will of some other part of their being. And so it's just like, it's happening to them, whether that's pleasurable or not, uh, that that is sort of like a rich experience on its own. Does, I mean, do you feel like, well, I guess maybe as a question is, are you, have you dabbled in lucid dreaming or other kinds of um, ways of enhancing your own agency in those spaces? Yes, I have. I, it's, that's a lot of work. It's, you know what the thing is, it's a lot of work in the waking life, which I'm too, too busy. <laughs> like you have to constantly be asking if, yourself if you're dreaming, which I just haven't had the time for, but there were moments where I was like, doing that and that was cool but yeah I I don't I don't mind right like surrendering in dreams and having things happen to me and um yeah and like sometimes that's more fun sometimes my dreams like laugh at me mm. like sometimes my unconsciousness is like ha 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 you still don't you see you're still like totally attached to your mother <laughs> dot 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 and like yeah it's nice to like um be powerless sometimes and let the unconsciousness take over are you are you all are you always or mostly always you in your dreams no but I don't know. I think about like Carl Jung saying like everyone in your dream is you. Mm -hmm. Right. But no, I've been like different things. Um, yeah, I've been different things. Are you, are, is there ever, uh, are you a different thing? And then the other, the other you is one of the characters in there. Like you, the, oh is interacting with being watered by you i've had like twin dreams or i've had dreams where like literally i'm working on something in my consciousness about like healing say like self-love and then i'll have a dream about like me making love to myself hmm. like or like encountering like the twin of me is that what you're saying is that what that question is <laughs> that wasn't but that's a great answer oh <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, that also is like a very like literalized version of that, but one that makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's so cool to to watch like, kind of like yeah, your mental knots um, get untied in your dreams. Um, I've had a lot of prophetic dreams or like weirdo things that have just like. Yeah, definitely prophetic dreams. And then also dreams of like ancestors. Like I swear I have 
healed certain ancestral lineage shit through like dreamscape. In the um, are you with that ancestor as they are your age or them as somebody who is now 150 or a ghost or what's the sort of are you in the <clears throat> where or was I in the what? I mean, are, are you visiting them in the shtetl or in wherever no. they were at the no. time it's happening? Well, well, there was what I had a dream once where an ancestor literally like sh the whole dream was them showing me their entire life, like from death to birth. And then, like it ended with them like being buried and I was like in the ground with them. But there was one in particular, this was a big dream where my mother and I were in a basement and like, it was a very creepy haunted basement. And we, we felt like we were like not safe. And my mom was freaking out. And I was, just, and I went to the middle of the basement floor and I started doing this magical ritual, like, which involves like all this Hebrew chanting and like, it's basically like the lesser banishing ritual in the middle of this basement. And then like, right as I finished the energy dissipated and my mom says, oh good, that was Aunt Rose. She's always doing that to me. Mm. And I found that confusing in the dream. But then like my mom and I walked upstairs after that. And then I, and when I woke up, I called my mom and told her about this dream. <laughs> and she's like, shut up. I was named after Aunt Rose. And like, I was always having nightmares as a kid of me being trapped in a basement and da da da. And I feel mm. like, there's something I did in that dream that like healed some lineage, um, some severed lineage tie. Wow. That's yeah. Cool. And you hadn't you hadn't heard those stories before about uh, your mother being named after her. I didn't even know there was Nat Rose. Huh. Yeah. And then I have dre I dreamt two days before this actually happened. I dreamt that men these bald men with a bunch of tattoos and guns were like arguing in this house and that i had to run away and like hide in this room in this house while they like were shooting at each other and two days later uh these, this group of squatters broke into my home and uh the when the i i my landlord called the police and the police came and the when the description of them was three bald men tattoos no teeth with guns <laughs> whoa yeah did you did you share with with her or with them or with the sergeant or whatever about the dream not with the police no um no i i mean i talked to my friends about this yeah um it was wild yeah and i you know, I, I read this great book too recently after these experiences by Eric Wargo called Time Loops, which basically is like, like there's like so many reports of like all the people who dreamt about 9-11 before it happened, all the people who dreamt about the Titanic before it happened and like just all the kind of research going on about how like all all everything is precognition that we're like it's our future selves constantly sending signals to our past selves just saying yeah and so that's also a thing i mean were the people that are being talked about in that moment did they have anything to do with those events or just that there are such mass events that their future selves are just like reading the newspaper and telling them what's happened as opposed to it being like about their lives yeah it's like you have this really emotional experience, like reading the, the headline of that atrocity and that like sends in like a jolt backwards. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, so I guess, I mean, you have, um, you know, a variety of sort of like mystical practices and without asking too much of you, can you sort of like theorize, I mean, the, the way that you're describing those dreams, the prophetic dreams, they function in a different way than the way that many people think about dreams. 
Um, and I'm wondering if you sort of, can you, can you sort of help us theorize a little bit about, I don't know, how, how do we think about these mystical occurrences outside of just as something that is like our uh, subconscious mind dealing with, with, the, with the things that we're unable to do in our waking lives? Dude, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> I don't know what the hell's going on. I, I do think that like time is not linear and there's just like, there's just so much more going on that my eyes can see. And I know that's the truth, but I just don't know what it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I think the thing that you're talking about with your mother in some ways is actually, I mean, one of the most interesting ones because it's this thing where, I mean, I've just been thinking for ever about the idea of one's own agency in somebody else's dreams. And I'm always very excited when somebody tells me that I was in their dream, just because, not that I think that I was there necessarily, but I'm just like very curious what that means, but in this way that can maybe be expanded. I mean, kind of in like a, an art way of, I don't know, the idea of like, if you were, I had this idea for a long time, I wanted to be in this person's novel, but I didn't want it to be like a character named Jesse. Like I wanted it that I was acting as this character. So it was only the writer and I knew that that was me, but that it was like very, mm -hmm. that, that was like that character was being played by. So it's like these things can happen with these kind of like complicated nestled authorships or something like that. But it's different to think about mm. dreams because uh, I don't know. I mean, it just like, I mean, art is already this sort of like fictive space. So if it's something that takes place in maybe like the nonfiction world of the real, that means something different. But that I don't know how you can, when you're describing like the sort of like ancestral healing and that that's somebody else's stuff that is being dealt with in your oneric space feels very interesting. It feels like it well first of all it um seems to imply that there's some sort of like shared space inside of those things that like maybe there are um you know like the the dream worlds touch each other in the same way that like waking worlds do uh including like not just butting up against other, but like integrating or something like that yeah I believe it. I believe it. I don't know how it works, but yeah, I think like I have a really psychic friend, my friend Olivia, like every time she like shares a bed with someone, like she will have like dreams that she seems for the other person that like she has to tell them like messages that are coming through her for the other person through the dream. Um, and oh, also listen to this. There was one night where I was sitting on my couch and uh, I just started like singing. I was by myself. I was having a moment with myself where I just started singing and I like ended up just like making up all, I just making up nonsense songs and made up like this, like literally like a whole album was written on this couch. I was just like shooting the shit. Um, and was kind of like surprising myself <laughs> by how cool these songs were. I went to bed and in the morning I get a text from this guy I, I met at an art residency that I hadn't seen or talked to in like five years. And he sends this really long text being like, hey, I dreamt about you last night. You were in the basement making up all of these songs and you came up from the basement to play all these songs for me. Like it was like all of basically him dictating what I was like going through the night before. It was really wild. Hmm. That's amazing. Was there any sort of reciprocity? Did you then dream their sculptures the next week or anything? Or? No. Yeah, I wonder like, yeah, if you're like, I know that like certain, like I have certain friends that show up in my dreams that I feel like are um, um, some kind of like symbolic guru or sage for me or like, I know I'm not really sure what I'm saying, but it's like, yeah, I think we are like connected and we are each other's archetypes like certain archetypal symbols for each other. And like, yeah, sometimes like 
our energies can collide where if they're needing our archetype for to help them heal something in their own psyche like we'll show up so i don't know i considered that as like this guy there's something about what i represent to him and his art <laughs> that like he needed to have me represent to heal something in him. And then like, I was like receptive to let him do that, like on an energetic level that night. Interesting, that has to do sort of with a kind of like improvisation or freedom or something like that in that moment, potentially. Maybe, yeah, like the looseness. Yeah. Yeah. And also as somebody who's like, maybe not principal work is music can then make a lot of music by being sort of just like almost sort of like a radio uh, antenna just like the radio doesn't know that song it just starts playing it for you <laughs> how did it do that and be like i don't know man it's just like it was just coming through me like ah <laughs> <laughs> yeah akashic akashic record songs yeah people just spinning the akashic records all day long just like next up <laughs> yeah <laughs> um do you so i guess i'm also curious then can you talk to us a little bit about like how are there other things from dreams that then make their way into your your various practices um yeah i mean i feel like dreaming is like the secret to life I feel like I'm way more focused on my dream life than I am my conscious life. And so like, I feel like when I make art, I'm probably in that state more than I am in my dumb, dumb conscious state, which like thinks like my consciousness, like thinks that it's like the totality of who I am, but it's like this mm -hmm. tiniest piece of who I am. And like my unconsciousness is everything. Um, I think of like, um, what's that Carl Jung quote? That's like, if you don't make shit, if you don't make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will, you will mistake it as fate. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I just think the unconscious is like, super powerful and has everything to do with what I make as an artist. And oftentimes I, it makes it for me. I don't even realize that like there's a connection being made. Like I didn't consciously do it, but it's like somehow I just picked up that object and it like, with, there was a synchronicity with like this color and whatever. Um, so it's nice to like, yeah, let my consciousness play second fiddle to my, to those instincts. Um, so like, I guess that's maybe like, as far as using my dreams for my work, like I use like the, the, the like mental state. Yeah. It's like the, the approach or the mental state as opposed to that dream of sculpture and make it the next day kind of thing. Yeah. That's interesting. So then in your waking life, are there ways you, are there practices you develop to sort of um, enter into that, those kinds of spaces, those kind of flow states, or however you want to describe it, when, when making things, when improvising in front of people, when whatever, however we want to describe it, like, if you have, yeah, rituals or eating or things like that. Yeah. Like, too many things, Jesse. Are they, are they trade secrets? I've gone down the rabbit hole. <laughs> um, my whole day is devoted to this stuff. Like, I just really believe in, <laughs> I really believe in magic. Like, I really believe in meditation, sure. Like, um, I'm always experimenting with some, with astrological magic, like, rituals and seeing what happens and I'm like always hurting myself <laughs> mm -hmm. 
doing things on accident, trying things out, but basically like a lot of trying to focus. It's a lot of like focusing exercises and also a lot of like trying to work my will. Um, and also like, yeah, like getting exercise. Also there's like, uh, it's just, there's like great herbs for dreaming, I think too, that I'll experiment with. And, um, you know, I spent, I spent like 10 years as an insomniac. Huh. So the, I think this is why this, oh yeah, I should have started with this. <laughs> I mean, we don't have to follow the law. We can use a dream logic instead of <laughs> narrative logic. Yeah. For many years, I never dreamt. So like once I started sleeping again, it was just like, bam, like I will commit so much of my energy to this. This is great. Huh. Um, when you were an insomniac, were there release valves that functioned? I mean, did you have daydreams or sort of like foggy, bleary eyed moments while biking or on the train that felt like they were substitutes for dreams? Yeah. Yeah, for a moment there, I was like, oh, I think like the chemicals of dreaming still are being released, <laughs> even though I'm not dreaming. <laughs> like it has to go somewhere. But um, no, I just always, so for some reason, surprisingly, like, and maybe this was just like me being a manic, crazy person, I like was pretty high functioning on no sleep. And I never had like, oh my gosh, I thought I was biking home and actually like in a different neighborhood now. Like it was very, I was still very awake and fine. Um, and nonetheless, like I just think magical things are always happening like all the time in my waking life, like synchronicities and like convergences of things and um yeah so that has not changed insomnia or no insomnia do we ever is the phrase somnia used as a way of describing people who are sleeping well <laughs> well i think it's like som somnos such as like the god of sleep yeah so to have insomnia would be not having that God around. Huh. I like that. Somnatic, somnatic visions, somnialism. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I have so many more questions, but I also feel like none of them are like at the tip of my mouth right now, which I know is uh, a cardinal sin for talk show hosts, but I'm relatively new at this. I, yeah, I'm like, do I ask you questions? You look so cozy and Thank like, you. It's you just, look it's like you have a lot to say about dreams. I'm very uncomfortable and it's daytime for me, but using the magic of uh, like a film education, I'm able to conjure this feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that I haven't, um, I don't know that, I mean, I, I have a lot of dream thoughts and a lot of dreams but um i don't know that they've changed dramatically in the last week of talking to people about their dreams all the time in a way that's a little bit disappointing <laughs> um, i feel like it would be very fun for me to do an interview like this and then discover that i was asleep i feel like that would be an interesting <laughs> to this like uh offer <laughs> some notes to myself but i feel like that would be kind yeah. of yeah. Do you, do you have dreams where you're, um, I mean, I know it's not the only thing you do, but like in particular with the sort of like improvisational performance stuff that you do or the performance, because I feel like it's, it's embodied in a way that maybe you've had dreams where you're editing video or you're looking at, um, at a chart or something like that. But 
are there is that an easier space to get into of of, of sort of like uh inside of the dream being inside of a thing being aware of the improvisational elasticity yeah that's funny you asked that because i did recently have a dream where i was performing and i drooled <laughs> like and when i woke up i was like oh that was me like you know when you're like performing like in real life you get up and like you kind of are like on this riding this wave of like being in control and not in control yeah and i was like oh the like i drooled in this dream like out of nowhere it was like i like reached the threshold of not being in control or something um in this performance uh anyways i don't know that's interesting that i'll say that uh in in the whatever in in the days of pandemic that's one of the things that it, upon reflection that i sort of like miss most and have these sort of um halcyon visions of of different times in terms of art making and publicness and i have a lot of feelings about those things and desiring them but the one one of the ones that comes most strongly and like strongly felt is the sort of uh, the feeling of performance and that lack of control and the sort of like improvisational flow and the energetic exchange um, is the thing that keeps coming back as like missing that more than the other things. There's a lot of things I miss, but that one feels like um, that one really cannot be conjured on one's own or through the mediation of the internet or through new public works or whatever. Um, and I, I feel like there's a way that there's so many things to miss, but that moment is one that I, is impossible to conjure otherwise. Oh, Jesse, it's so true. I know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I feel like I'm feeling less higher sensations. Like there's nothing like being on stage and like having to be present and like high sensation like that. It's just like, yeah, I guess maybe I'm trying to feel it in other places, but. Yeah, I definitely miss it. And we're all, I, I'm like waiting, I think like, yeah, COVID, after COVID will be a little traumatic, like um, coming out into the wild again. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very curious. I mean, I mean, everybody's very curious, but I feel like I just keep having these moments being like, well, is this gonna happen? Is it gonna be this like, explosion of this kind of energy and activity is there also going to be this whole sector of the population that like never returns to going into public of being like <laughs> be like this netflix drug and the sort of like hamster wheel of instacart and whatever like <laughs> is just right and that'll leave maybe the people who need this sort of like extroversion and energy and exchange will be now like unencumbered by people who wish that they weren't at the party and it'll just be the people who are like Ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah it would be yeah it would be cool if like introverts like no i don't know sorry i'm thinking of like introverts taking over the world i also do think that just like everyone's gonna start going to sex parties after covid i think that'll be a big thing that's a that's that's a trend watch for third quarter 2021 you <laughs> yeah do your have, how much of your dreams changed in COVID are there uh is viral thinking a part of it are you are there distances being kept or not maintained are there masks hmm um the um I don't think they've changed so much it's funny you asked that because my friend just had a baby and like we're all like hovering over it with these masks and I'm like this poor child it's gonna have some weird mask fetish and like <laughs> I don't know if it's like reading my eyes really intently like if it's gonna be an eye reader yeah it's just like one where it's like, two years were born that like have no facial recognition for this whole part but they're like genius <laughs> in their eyes and they're gonna be good for figuring they'll be like great detectives and all these kinds of things, but like really bad at communicating with their <laughs> like, didn't understand what you just said. So I was just so 
locked in <laughs> virus with all you were saying. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think my dreams have changed. I think maybe I've like had more time to really like focus on my dreams. So that's been cool. I like, I, you know, I feel like COVID because of that, I feel like COVID has, at least for me, I know there's so many crazy things happening and this is, and this is maybe unique, but I feel like COVID has made me more whole um, because of all this time with myself, because of being able to like just sleep and dream and, um, and I think that's what dreaming's for actually. It's like really getting to know your dreams and the symbols it's showing you is to get to know this like darkness in you and this, yeah, the subconscious realm. And so that you can like make it whole or like dissolve the barrier between it, it, that and your consciousness. And I feel like, yeah, if COVID did anything for me, that's been, that's been the journey. That is great. That's the, the big theory and the personal thing. Let's, let's, uh, let's call the interview with that. Cool. That was a great ending. Um, thank you so much for being on the late, 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 late show. Um, Blair Bogan, a pleasure as always to see you and I'm sure for the audience, a, a wonderful experience. Thank you. And- Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. And, and, and 21. 2021. Hope to see you soon. All right. All right. Good night. Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams. <laughs>